Hello and welcome to the MIOT Summit, um, connecting the next billion of everything. My name's Richard Cockle and I'm the head of IoT identity and big data at the GSMA. And our aim is to very much support the industry to continue to focus the growth of the sector around MIOT. We've gone through a little bit of a change in terms of the way that we work. We now have moved away from having a dedicated program, but towards a more focused, embedded way of working. We have something called the IoT Strategy Group, which is made up of 13 of the biggest participants in the MIOT sector at the moment. And that's very much looking to try and solve some of the challenges, some of the challenges being faced today, but then also trying to get the industry ready for the 5G era. And alongside that, we've also got a marketing program, which is there to promote the MIOT solutions and bring the industry together to be able to ensure that we have as much impact as possible. Alongside that dedicated focus on IoT and MIOT, we also have started a deep engagement with a number of the vertical industries. So as you can see, we've got dedicated vertical industry groups which are reaching into the manufacturing, the aviation, the automotive and mobility sector, and financial services. With the aim to very much build relationships for us, the mobile ecosystem, and their own ecosystems, and very much learn from each other. So learn what their requirements are, but then also in educate them on what the solutions are which could be provided. Alongside the communities, we've also got what we call the GSMA Foundry. And a GSMA Foundry is a new way of working that we've introduced, which is aimed at working with committed, focused partners to develop, evolve, and create new solutions that solve industry challenges. And those can be anything from a new idea to accelerating a solution in its growth in the marketplace. And the aim is to bring together those cross-collaboration um, communities um, and work in a very independent, agile way. So the governance of the groups will be based around the participants. We'll be looking for those participants to have skin in the game so that they are as committed to the projects as we are. And we'll aim to run them agile in an agile way. So we'll no longer work on long-term programs, but focus on small sprint projects, which can deliver solutions quicker and bring the proof points to the industry in a faster way. And these two, these two areas will work together. And just to give you an indication, you can see that we've got the customer verticals, but we're also working in terms of the broader the technology solutions. So we'll have communities around Telco Edge. We'll have communities around open networks. And those will generate a number of projects for the foundry to deliver. So we've actually got a Telco Edge, we've got a number of Telco Edge trials ongoing at the moment. But we're here to talk about MIOT and, and the IoT sector. I won't go into these in too much detail, so I'm sure we'll hear a lot about these in the rest of the session. But as you can see, by 2025, we're going to see some significant growth within the industry um, and the number of devices which are being used. But we'll also see a development in terms of the revenues as new products and services come online. And hopefully through today's session, we'll, we'll do some thinking around what opportunities have we, have we created already, but then also what are the ones that will be coming in the future. So what is the GSMA actually doing to support the development of MIOT and the broader IoT segment? We've got three key focuses, and those key focuses are ones which you'll hear more about today. We'll focus on access. So how can we improve the coverage? How can we make customers more aware of the availability of the service? So if you go to the GSMA website, you'll be able to see where we've worked alongside a number of the key um, supporters and partners to develop a coverage map. But we also realize that there's challenges for developers in terms of, and manufacturers in terms of understanding how does the mobile network work. So we've been working with the group of mobile operators 
to define what those core device configurations and network configurations need to be. So we can, we can ensure that there is a common platform across the industry in terms of the solutions which are being provided. So that should mean that you can use a device in one market and it roams and it goes into another market and it easily connects. And we know that there's been some challenges with those things in the past. In terms of enablement, we'll hear more later on about eSIM and the growth of eSIM. We have over, I think it's a billion eSIMs now deployed into the market. But in terms of the IoT strategy group, we are also looking at how we can improve the solutions which should be provided and meet the, you know, meet the claims and the promises which have been made around long-term battery life and a number of other um, items like that. And of course, security and trust. And there'll be a lot more far more educated people up here in, later on today to tell you about those items. But the GSMA has got its IoT safe group, and we've also got um, a security focus within our fraud and security group to ensure that we are developing truly trusted solutions that are secure and safe for customers to use. But mobile IoT is scaling. And as I mentioned, our coverage map is showing that it continues to grow. We've got over 158 networks now connected with either MBIoT or LTEM solutions. And that number continues to grow. But alongside that, we're also starting to see the development of the key enablers to make MIoT and IoT solutions truly mass scale. You'll see there that Telenor and Telstra have recently won some large long-term deals. And I very much see that as the starting point for, where it, for fueling the belief that MIoT and these kinds of solutions will be a true revenue driver in the future. So you'll see Telstra wins a 15-year deal to provide over a million devices. And that is not insignificant, and that really does, from an operator perspective, start to put it onto the radar of the senior executives when you start looking at the P&L. But it's one thing to have a great coverage map. It's another thing to have loads of networks which are live. But the promise of MIoT is that you'll be able to use it everywhere. So it was brilliant to see Deutsche Telekom announce that roaming is now, now available in over 20 markets for their solutions. And for me, that's again a, a demonstration of the maturity and the maturing of the industry to ensure that the promises of the connectivity can be provided. Now, thanks very much for coming, and thanks to, you, thanks to those of you on the MWC app that's joining us virtually. Um, I hope it's going to be a good experience and you'll gather a lot of. Um, good information. But I would like to just take the time to, uh, to mention our sponsors and a big thank you to Huawei and to Sony for supporting this event. Um, it's obviously been a challenging year and we really do thank the support that we've received from those organizations. And we do intend to ensure that this, this platform continues to grow and we continue, continue to build this out when we're all hopefully back here in um, in 22. So we've got a jam-packed agenda for you. Um, first up, we'll, see, we'll hear from Kobe, who will give us an overview from Huawei. And that'll be a very much a look back at where we've come from and a look into the future about what we might have. And then we'll go into roaming and, under, and hear a bit more from Jens around the items that I've discussed around roaming its, and, and, its, and its growth. And then we have a third keynote from Sony, where we'll be looking into the more secure chipsets and that real element of trust going forward. We then have a number of panels for you. We have a panel where we look into that in a bit more detail around the roaming. And then we'll also start to look into the eSIM and iSIM topics. And then we'll wrap the day off with looking at a bit more, with a bit more focus on the security elements, 
with, the, um, with a number of deep dives into IoT Safe. Keegan will give us an overview of what they've done, and then we'll have a panel discussion where we can go into that in a bit more detail. So with all of that said, I would just like to say a huge thank you to all of you that have attended, a huge thank you to all of you that are online. I really do hope you enjoyed today's session, and I'd just like to welcome Kobe on stage to give us the view from Huawei. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming. My name is Kobe, and I'm from Huawei. I'm delighted to be here today with you. I hope some more people join us a bit later. Uh, today, I will present Huawei's perspective, one step backward, then forward, on the current state of mobile IoT, the way we see it, and Industry 4.0 but all that in the light of 5G that is present. So I will provide insight also to kind of take a look in our little crystal ball on what's coming. So I hope that'd be interesting for you. Uh, this is not a, a sales presentation, nor it is a product or a technical uh, session. So I hope I'm not disappointing anyone, but we would like to kind of set the scene for the rest of today with our uh, view. So I left my contact details at the end of this presentation. We don't have time for questions, unfortunately. Anyone wants to stay in touch or get in touch you can find my contact details there. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's start. First, a few words about myself. I've been the, in the IT, ICT industry for over 30 years now. I'm with Huawei since 2015. And I'm on the ground doing or working on digital transformation projects, big and small, and IoT projects across Europe and beyond. And, um, and I, I feel that I have a, a, a good perspective on what's really going on uh, on the ground. So, like I said, my contact details are there. You can feel free to, to contact me uh, later. So, Huawei is a proud sponsor of this event. For the sake of those who are not aware of what Huawei is doing in the space, or perhaps partially aware, and at the risk of stating the obvious for those who do know what Huawei does, I would like to repeat some of it. So Huawei is really passionate about intelligent communications and IoT. We are very, very active in all aspects of it. You might know some of them or all of them, I'd like to mention some. So 5G, obviously, we are very active, but we are not limiting to, limited to 5G. We are, I will present some of the initiatives on 5.5G. And, and, uh, and uh, perhaps beyond that as well, we're having a look at beyond that. Some of the stuff, other stuff that we're working on are fixed and mobile convergence, in the industrial IoT, uh, one big topic for us is uh, V2X. And smart cities, smart healthcare, you might see that on our booth. We're obviously doing some hardcore native core cloud, uh, edge computing, artificial intelligence. And of course, everybody knows we're doing hardware, chipsets, cameras, devices. All that is done by Huawei and is done in collaboration with our telecom operators, customers, enterprise clients, directly with the enterprise clients, consumers and industry and technology partners. So we are definitely invested in this topic and we are promoting it. So without further ado, I'd like to jump in into my presentation and start with, uh, start and tell you uh, a tale an adventure tale, a bit of uh, spicing it up, of digital evolution and natural selection, actually. The topics that I'm going to cover are beginning of how we got where we are now to where we are now, uh, where we are actually now in mobile IoT, what's the impact of 5G on our industry, 
And finally, take a look at the future and some predictions of what's coming. So, evolution. It's all it all began in the 90s, early 90s, when, we when 2G was launched uh, uh, and data started to flow. I'm not going to go into much detail there. 3G was launched in 2001 by NTT Docomo. I would like to mention two important launches during the 3G era. One was of the BlackBerry in 2002, which kind of boosted data in the corporate world. And 2007, the iPhone, which obviously changed a lot in the consumer world in terms of usage of data. <clears throat> 4G was later launched in Stockholm and, uh, and Oslo in 2009 as part of the LTE 4G standard. Um, <clears throat> that brings us to 5G. What's the promise? What's the, what's the vision for 5G? It was the big, big uh, idea, big vision that the next digital transformation, next digital revolution would see billions of smart devices connected and providing data and actually getting involved in our lives. <clears throat> so, a bit of uh, history here. Excuse the busy slide, but it's there to explain. Um, uh, please move forward uh, with, this, with the script, thank you. The history of the IoT, or the mobile IoT at least, I would like to take us back, like 100 years back or more, uh, to 24th, 24th of November, 1859. Uh, a gentleman called Charles Darwin has actually launched, uh, just published a book called On the Origin of Species, where he introduced the concept of natural selection. I'd like to apply that concept to what you see here. Uh, he talks about the survival of the fittest, so those who can adapt can, uh, and change, can pass their genes or their traits into the next generations and survive. Wowie believes that what you see here on the screen is a bit like that. It's an evolution of standards in mobile IoT. We would like to highlight three of them. The first one was uh, launched in release uh, 8 back in uh, 2009. 4G CAT1, or otherwise known as LTE CAT1. The second oh, and the third ones are on the right, CATM1, or as we call it, LTEM. Oh, and the other one is Narrowband Internet of Things, NBIoT, launched in 2016 and released in release 13. So, <clears throat> There was a little bit of confusion at the beginning between these two like latest LTEM or EMTC and narrowband IoT. There was a bit of a competition between what they, each one can do and who, which one belongs where. This was resolved in 2017, actually June, where they were split on bandwidth, where EMTC or LTEM was the higher bandwidth, 1.4 megahertz and above, and narrowband IoT was limited to 200 kilohertz and below. I kind of solved that thing, which allowed us to move forward. <clears throat> okay, so we're moving forward here. And based on the popularity of these two standards, what we see is that they have managed to cross from the 4G into the 5G generation, crossing the chasm. Actually, you see the message there that in July 2020, only a year ago, they were officially accepted into the family of the 5G standards as official legal members of the, of the, of the 5G standards. Uh, as was mentioned before me, before me, there are 136 operators actually using these standards right now, either deployed or and launched uh, in 64 countries. This tells a story about these technologies. They are present, they are alive, and they are officially accepted into 5G as, uh, as, uh, as valid members of the, of the family. <clears throat> From a Huawei perspective, Huawei actually followed and led some of these standards, but it's not limited only to the standards. It's actually made products to support the evolution of, uh, of these uh, technologies, these standards. 
And while we continue to do that with its, uh, with its E-RAN solutions from the LTE world into 5G. So I'm not going to go into the versions and their features, but some of the stuff you can see there on the 5G days of these standards are involved with latency, with mixed networks, connectivity to the 5G, and coexistence 4G and 5G. So what we see here as a summary is that two standards have managed to cross from the forest of the standards we saw earlier, managed to cross into 5G. Now, before I carry on into the next chapter, I would like to show some real life cases, show six success stories of Huawei's project with our partners, with our ecosystem partners. We don't do them alone, obviously, and they are realizing some real life value today with these technologies. So let's see if that works. Smart Street Labs are deployed citywide, supporting individual lab control and automatic inspection. This solution not only fulfills lighting requirements, but also reduces energy consumption by 25 to 30 percent, making cities cleaner and greener. Smart Parking Parking spaces can be monitored in real time by using connected geomagnetic sensors. This helps shorten the time to find available parking spaces increases the parking turnover rate, decreases the number of parking violations, improves parking management, and effectively reduces traffic congestion. Smart metering. Unified access for intelligent meters allows remote metering. Intelligent analysis of urban gas and water consumption enables on-demand supply, solves urban supply imbalance, and increases citizen satisfaction. Smart Firefighting MBLT Smart Smoke Detectors Support plug and play and real-time monitoring of firefighting devices which simplifies firefighting system reconstruction and helps prevent fires in small schools, stores, restaurants and more. Immediate response to fires, safeguards, residents' lives. Smart Greenhouse Intelligent sensors monitor the greenhouse environment 24-7. Indicators can be viewed in real time. Remote device control not only promotes the high quality and yield of agricultural products, but also reduces the labor cost by 90% and improves working efficiency by 60%. This leads to smart agriculture. Smart River Chief System Various sensors are used in multiple bodies of water to monitor water quality in real time. Monitoring responsibilities can be assigned to specific owners, and pollution sources can be traced. The efficiency of emergency response can be improved by 30% for governments. So these are real-life cases showing value today. Moving on, um, there's a big topic I want to discuss, which is the relevancy of these technologies, specifically narrowband IoT, to replace, I call it legacy, mobile IoT technologies such as uh, M2M, machine-to-machine -machine connectivity based on 2G and 3G generations. And you'd be surprised how many of them still exist. So for a long time, operators and enterprises actually rejected or hesitated in retiring 2G and 3G M2M solutions they have uh, for, uh, for many years. As of re we believe in Huawei that as of release 14, narrowband IoT proves to be an adequate replacement for those legacies. It is more secure. We can look at the left. It is more secure. It's better, it has better coverage, better power efficiency, better mobility, longer life expectancy, and more recently, and I will show that a bit later as well, Competitive, better competitive pricing, which was one of the stumbling blocks in adopting uh, these technologies. Replacing 2G M2M with narrowband IoT releases significant resources for operators who are using spectrum and having to maintain 2G networks in keeping them alive. We believe now it's the time 
to look at, uh, look at solutions that are based on narrowband IoT in replacement of these uh, legacies. On the right of my slide, you can see some of the devices. There are hundreds of them who are capable nowadays to replace these 2G M2M uh, devices. Moving forward. That's been kind of evolutionary kind of view. I want to look at what's, what we have now. So um, <clears throat> here are some numbers. Uh, we have revenue and we have shipments. I think these are interesting numbers for you to, to kind of take a look at. On the left, we have the current picture, current global picture of which industries are invested in mobile IoT recently, like 2020. You see, these numbers are relevant. On the top five, you see industries that you wouldn't normally expect to see in the old days of, of IoT. You see automotive, you can see enterprises, industri industrial, telematics, but you also see the smart metering. What we say about revenue here is that these industries are overtaking the, the early movers on the narrowband IoT, M2M uh, solutions, like smart metering, they are up and coming. <clears throat> on the right, you see shipments, but split between China and the rest of the world. I think it's very important to have a look at the trends from China. We believe that China can, in some way, both show the way as well as influence the rollout of mobile IoT and the changes in mobile IoT in the rest of the world. So if you look on the, if you look on the right, right uh, you see volumes of, uh, of uh, units sold and the big difference in terms of colors between China and the rest of the world. In China, narrowband IoT is king. You can see the numbers. While LTE Cat 1, which is from release uh, nine originally, as, as I mentioned earlier, is gaining momentum these days. In the days of 5G uh, networks, it's ramping up. While clearly you can see that 2G M2M is almost eradicated in China. And I'll show the next slide why. While on the global market, on the same, same side, you see that 20% are M2M solutions based on 2G and 3G. I call them legacy. We can also see that in China, LTEM, and, or as, it, as it's called otherwise, EMTC, is declining. Actually, it doesn't show on the graph almost at all. These are interesting numbers. Okay, so to summarize, we see that there is a huge movement on narrowband IoT globally in terms of shipment, and we see different split, recent split of revenues in terms of who is adopting mobile IoT. Okay. This slide is kind of saying almost the same, but with a bit more details. You can see that China Telecom has reached 100 million narrowband IoT connections by mid this year. That's a massive uh, milestone with over 97% territorial coverage with, uh, with this technology. And China Mobile, the fact that I want to, uh, to highlight here is that they've stopped accepting 2G M2M connections, new connections, new devices. They're kind of putting a stop, stop to that with the, with the outlook to actually uh, phase it out. And on the right, you have like seven years, but let's, let's look forward, four, uh, four or five years of forecast of how mobile IoT is growing and the proportion of, uh, mobile, uh, of narrowband IoT within that. We actually see 5.5-fold increase of the usage of narrowband IoT. Okay. Okay. Okay, so on the left, left, what you see here is a snapshot of the shipments of modules uh, of narrowband IoT. And what I did here with this diagram is kind of repeat what I said in words, but show it in, in, in an image. 
Smart metering is still the cash cow, for those who are aware of the term. Uh, kind of low growth still, but uh, with good revenue, uh, good market share, but uh, low growth uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry. What we believe is that the new telematics, industrial enterprise, etc., cetera, and, and, and vehicles will become the stars. Okay, this will take time, but this, this is the direction. So to summarize this part, I would say that this picture is current and it confirms what we expect, that 5G and the applications that are coming with it are already changing the face of mobile IoT. Okay. This is about LTE Cat 1. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you can see that it's also expect unexpectedly is expected to ramp up. Uh, it's actually represent, is represented in China as 12% of the mobile IoT connections, and globally it's actually 23%. So there is a demand, and it's growing, and it's growing significantly. There's a demand for 4G-based middle bandwidth rate of connectivity. And that, these are the forecasts and the type of applications that are, are used uh, with the Cat1 in China and, uh, and beyond. We're looking at sharing economy, like scooters and, and two, uh, two, uh, two and four uh, wheels vehicles. There's a case here on the right. Look at the numbers, $80 billion revenue charged through this uh, sharing economy. Point of sales applications, tr tracking, wearables that are coming. So LTE Cat1 unexpectedly is, pro is performing cost-effectively, and there are more and more solutions coming, uh, coming to market with it. So kind of on the field proving to be solid for medium-rate applications. Okay, so let's move on. Time is short, 5G era. I'm not gonna teach you how to suck egg, <laughs> but 5G is... Uh, represent the uh, extension of the devices into ultra-smart devices in the future, both active and passive, and anything in between, into every corner of our lives, both as individuals, consumers, and businesses. There is an evolution to it. ITU has proposed uh, these three uh, case study uh, areas where we have enhanced mobile uh, broadband, EMBB, we have massive machine type communications, and we have ultra reliable low latency URLC communications. This is where the industry, and this is what we see the evolution of it. You can see it from the technology perspective, which I'm not going to dive into, into the areas of applications that we're talking about. And in the boots and all the stands, you can see applications like smart city, smart home, etc. while self-driving car is still not there, but things are, are being worked on. So the evolution of 5G is gradual and is based around these three, uh, three GPP kind of areas, use cases areas. And it's growing, it's growing fast. You can see the numbers. Uh, since 2009, we see dramatic increase in deployed 5G networks. Huawei is involved in many of them, terminals and numbers of users. We experience increased variety of modules and solutions, so vendors coming up with more solutions. And the economy of scale is kicking in, and the prices are starting to come down. There are still challenges to the operators. I'm not going to go into this. There is, uh, there's, and you will perhaps hear about them in the, se in the sessions to come, edge computing, Cloudifications, core cloud, real cloud, and uh, moving from non-standalone non to standalone 5G networks. But that's actually irrelevant right now for our discussion. So let's take the fourth and final step in my journey, in my evolution story, a decade outlook uh, ahead. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but uh, as part of Huawei being active and looking forward, uh, we already see beyond the 5G as, as we know it today, although we are definitely 
on the commercialization roadmap, and we are very active in, in participating in the commercialization and bringing it to market. But we also have the research and development activities, and we are investing in the next opportunities. So we call that thing on the right 5.5G. Okay? So we see that as the next evolution of the 5G and how it's relevant to, to IoT, let's, let's uh, highlight it a bit. Uh, this thing, if adopted, can address growing demands in the areas of immerse, immersive experience, for example. And I will explain a little bit more of each of the red, or rosy, rosy circles there. Immersive experience, as in virtual reality, augmented reality, AI, holograms, we believe that can bring, bring it about. Or, or move it faster anyway. As well as diverse, more diverse IoT applications and requirements such as machine vision, V2X, and more. So let's, let's, uh, let's dwell in, uh, oops, sorry. Let's dwell in uh, into those, I will explain them a little bit more. So we see three circles, UCBC, we see RTBC, HCS. To keep it simple, I'll just give them a short name, although you see what's the full name there. One is called AppLink, the other one is called RealTime, and the third one is called Sensing, in my presentation. The full name is there. We believe that 5G with these features, 5.5G with these features, will perform significantly better and increase the, the, the availability of mobile IoT uh, solutions uh, in many respects. Okay. For example, UCBC, so the, uh, the first one on the left, uplink, can help cut, help cut down cost of per bit EMBB by tenfold. That is actually adequate to address about, our estimate, 80% of the 5G to B, to business scenarios. That is significant. RTBC real-time can provide gigabytes downlink at a very, uh, a very uh, fast or low latency, five milliseconds, to increase uh, the usage of XR, artif artificial, in, um, uh, artificial uh, reality and virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, excuse me, by many folds. So we believe that is the next wave and real-time can help that. Sensing HCS, can provide scenarios like high precision indoors positioning with low power centimeter level accuracy. Think about the use cases there. On the wide area, the same sensing technology can, uh, can enhance safety and help self-driving cars position themselves. We believe that is absolutely mandatory. While we already proposed that 5.5G a solution to 3GPP, and it's being considered. We're hoping to see it coming uh, in the next releases. Okay. As an outlook for the decade, that's not what we're saying. That's the market. The expectation is that the initial three to five years will be the launch of 5G for many operators. We start to see them in the industry and IoT as well. 5G expansion. More, more use cases, more services, perhaps as a uh, red cap, uh, reduced capa capability, and other case studies will come at the latter part of this. Actually, 3GPP has adopted a program called 5G Advanced as of release 18, which is starting hopefully next year, to advance these topics. The expectations of the market is that 6G is somehow, somewhere, around the corner in 2030. Could be later, but that's the expectations. Okay, to summarize my presentation, time is running out. I would like to show this slide. <sighs> okay, so kind of summarize what I said earlier. We believe that narrowband IoT will take the majority part in terms of percentage, 60% of the lower bandwidth connectivity and mobile IoT in the market. We believe that China trend will, will become uh, more proliferant outside of China. 
the connection between China and outside of China would be on price points. Once the numbers in China are growing for devices, the price is dropping, and that becomes more accessible outside of China. So they believe that narrowband IoT in the era of 5G will become the most significant uh, technology to cover most cases in terms of volume. Uh, it's our prediction, but it's also our recommendations as well. We. Second tier, mid middle tier, is LTE Cat 1. You would notice that I don't mention LTEM or EMTC, although it is part of the 5G standard. One of the reasons is we see the momentum that LTE Cat 1 is taking off now and the reduction of the use of it in China, and we believe that that will repeat itself. There are reasons for that. Pricing is one, capabilities and the availability of, uh, of it. Uh, such a long time on the 4G networks without uh, licensing costs. So we believe that that will become the predominant uh, uh, technology in the middle tier. And finally, we see the 5G uh, new generation, new, new, uh, new technology coming up on the higher bandwidth, ultra bandwidth. Okay, so there are some cases here uh, where we see this, this could be relevant uh, for, uh, for which industries it could be relevant. Okay, so a little bit uh, longer term pr uh, predictions. We show on the left where uh, the, bi the bigger bulk of the, of, the, of the prediction is narrowband IoT, but you can see that CAT1 is there, like I mentioned, but you see new technologies like Red Cap, which is the semi-passive uh, reduced capabilities, wearables, and other technologies that are coming up. The standard is still not there, the technology is still not there, but we can see prediction on the right, where in 2022, perhaps a bit later, things will start to ramp up. Okay, so this is our prediction to get to, to 2025 with two and a half billion connections. On the right, the important part, not only that the introduction of uh, new technologies, like 5G and so on, but you can see the pricing. And I summarized it for you on the right most side where you can see the drop over five years predicted, drop of price in the next five years. We believe that is significant to vendors who are developing the, the hardware, the devices, the sensors, as well as operators to, to kind of help uh, promote the, the, the technologies, including narrowband IoT. Narrowband IoT, although it's a small red dot there in terms of price, is dropping from 2.4, I believe it's US dollars, uh, to 1.4, which is like 40% 40, 40 drop. It is significant. So, to summarize, narrowband IoT will still dominate the landscape and we expect prices to cut down significantly as the volume rises. So, last, uh, last uh, slide on this, uh, on this story, on this journey. 5G is here, and the era of 5G is here. It's a decade, we believe, of massive IoT, driven by innovation and viable business cases, with a growing focus of the telecom industry on smart industry, with more use cases outside the, uh, the usual. With this picture, our story, my story, comes to an end, the tale of uh, evolution. And at what we believe that uh, mobile IoT is transforming now as we speak. We see it in China and we see it here. And uh, with the introduction of services and solutions, like I presented 5.5G and similar, we believe that the world is on target for 100 billion connections by uh, mobile, I mobile IoT connections by 2030. Here, we put some of the drivers, why we believe it will get there, and some of the applications that will be available. We've done that with our little crystal ball, <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank you for listening and attending this session. Anyone needs to contact me, the details are there. Thank you very much.
This way. Yeah, that yeah. way. Oh, no, thanks very much, Kobe. That was um, fantastic. So now we're going to do a little bit of technology and see if we can get this to work. We should be having Jens Olak from DT um, streaming directly into us. So let's see if the technology works. Jens, can you hear us from Barcelona? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can definitely hear you. I feel like I'm on the um, Eurovision Song Contest. So over to you. <laughs> And Germany yesterday was equally unsuccessful. Okay, never mind. So my name is Jens Oliak. Welcome everybody from Bonn. I work for Deutsche Telekom IoT. Um, I'm heading a team called UX Technologies. We're responsible for exploring, introducing and growing new IoT technologies such as NDLT and LTM, as well as 5G as, and, and related products. So all in the area of IoT connectivity. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving us the chance to, to speak here. The purpose of my presentation today is to share some of the challenges in IoT uh, that customers face and how we as operators and vendors can work together to overcome them, okay? So before, um, before I start with the actual topic, let's, uh, let, me introduce to, let me introduce you to Deutsche Telekom. I'm using my clicker right now. This one doesn't seem to work, does it? Trying to advance a slide here. So this doesn't seem to, now it does. Okay, so about Deutsche Telekom, I, I guess most of you should know Deutsche Telekom already. We're a large integrated telco operator with networks in Europe and the US. Uh, we are present in more than 50 countries and have got revenues uh, in excess of 100 billion euros. And I think that's that's all for now. Let's focus on IoT. So within Deutsche Telekom, there's an area called DT IoT, and I'm trying to advance the slide again. So uh, within Deutsche Telekom, there's an area called DT IoT. Uh, we are the the unit responsible for driving the IoT business for our company. We are both a separate legal entity as well as a tribe across the organizational structure of Deutsche Telekom with around 600 people working on IoT. So let's let's get going with mobile IoT. So, so in the previous introduction, can you advance the slide, please? The previous uh, uh, speech, we already talked a lot about NBIoT and LTM, so I don't think I need to add much more about this. We as Deutsche Telekom have a very similar view to Huawei. Uh, maybe the only difference is we we see LTM also as a, as a very important technology technology, especially specifically with um, ongoing 2G and 3G shutdowns. And we see this as a primary substitute, especially for um, use cases that consume a lot of, um, a lot of uh, mobile data. But we introduced both of these technologies, uh, sorry, we introduced NDLT in 20, 2017 in several of our countries. Now, uh, 10 of them are, um, have active NDLT networks. And LTM was introduced in the first four countries in, um, in 29, 2020 last year. So we always felt a huge interest for those technologies because they were, and they are still addressing specific needs of uh, IoT use cases that other technologies such as 2G, 3G, or even LTE cannot fulfill. So we have several hundreds or actually even thousands of customers who are, as we speak, using and, and also uh, exploring and, and developing devices for these technologies. But to be honest, since these are new technologies, um, we, need to be, we need to be realistic. Nearly, nearly all of those companies have encountered some challenges with, those new, uh, with NBLT and LTM at some point. So I'll explain what barriers we observe that keep customers or kept customers from massively deploying a mobile IoT and how we can come, overcome them in, uh, by partnerships, international partnerships between operators and, and vendors. But let me, let me stress that we've already come a long way in fixing many of those issues. So I think quite a few issues have already been solved through collaboration of MNOs and vendors, um, and also pretty much organized by the GSMA in many cases. Um, and we now see increasingly customers, uh, our customers uh, starting their, uh, their massive IoT deployments in terms of um, thousands or, or uh, 10,000 of devices, which is, which is pretty easy. We observe 
volumes of uh, active NVLT and LTM devices uh, increasing exponentially on our networks as well. So, um, yeah, let's first talk about the challenges. I'm now trying to advance the slide. Perfect, thank you. The challenges of IoT are not specific to NVLT and LTM. I think those challenges are even maybe uh, applicable to any new technology. So, first of all, customers will ask themselves, like, why do I need IoT? Why do I need this new technology in the first place? What problem does it uh, will, will it solve? And if I employ IoT, why? What business benefits will I get, and how can I quantify them? And then, what are the what are the real costs of of deploying operating such a solution? And and in, in my organization, do I have do we have the capabilities and the skills and the know how to to execute it um, sustainably? So those are all strategic challenges. Of course, there are always technological challenges as well. So what standards to use? Are you going for NBLT or LTM, or going for non-cellular? Proprietary technologies on an unlicensed spectrum. That's a question many customers ask themselves. What uh, like protocols and uh, like application protocols and standards they, they should go for? Which components they should include in their in their devices? Um, what about the technical issues and risks, of course? And then even every and everything is running. How do you operate this uh, this uh, this IoT end to end solution? Okay, so lots of lots of challenges. Let me come to them one by one. Um, it's always a, a complex solution development for, for uh, companies. Uh, IoT is always new to customers, even if they even if they work with 2G, 3G, or LoRaWAN beforehand, and they're now switching to NBLT and LTM, it's still a very complex uh, device and solution development. So barriers are being removed, as I said. Let's start with the first of them. Let's start with roaming, which is, uh, of course, a huge, maybe, maybe the number one, barrier. So I think it's fair to say that the majority of companies using IoT or mobile IoT require roaming. According to a recent survey um, within Deutsche Telekom, it's around even 75% customers. That, that doesn't mean that they are all having mobile use cases. So it's important, extremely important to understand that roaming is, is also required for stationary use case if you want to ship your devices, for example, across Europe. So we have many examples, uh, Hydro Contra from Spain with irrigation systems or Sensor Neo from Slovakia with fill level monitoring or ISTA from Germany who are, who are building devices that, that, needs to, that, that need to run in, in the whole of Europe without uh, exchanging um, SIM cards or having different stock keeping units for different, different countries. So it's obvious for us that roaming is important. Now, the good thing is the global rollout of NBLT is going well. Um, there are 105 launches so far, and I'm extremely happy that this figure is consistent to the presentation shown earlier. Um, so this is the GSMA figure. The Global Supply Association uh, even uh, claims 120 launches. So that's that's pretty good. Um, those are in 54 markets, and we as Dodge can already cover 21 of them, and we are we are extending our footprint um, basically every month. So we hope that we'll have most of Europe uh, and many other countries covered very soon. So trying to advance. So that was actually the slide that I was talking about. Oh, can you please advance one more one more slide? Thank you. Um, so regarding LTM, things look similar. Um, there are there are a few uh, there are fewer come fewer countries covered by LTM 54, 53 so far, of which we can serve uh, 13. This is because we, uh, even within Deutsche Telekom, and we, we also, as we observed other operators, many, especially in Europe, they start with NBLT and then deploy LTM later. But that's a growing um, acceptance for LTM as a 2G, 3G institute. And so uh, my message to any operator in this room um, and, and online would be to please uh, advance your NBLT and LTM rollouts and please engage in roaming agreements with other operators because your customers will also need it um, for sure. So um, yeah, that's, that's about roaming, except that for the question maybe, what reason should an operator have to introduce NBLT and LTM and, and, and open up for roaming? So what's the what's the monetization of roaming for operators, which leads us to the next challenge, maybe from an operator perspective. 
So monetizing NBRT and LTM networks. The, the issue we have here, or you used to have here, that classic wholesale charging models are not suitable for mobile LTE. Why is this so? Because they are volume-based, so they're rating uh, in fees per gigabyte, which means that you as an inbound operator would actually get very little money or even no money uh, given the small NBRT data payloads. So even sometimes they're even zero around it, so you will get nothing and you would get no fees for dormant IMSIs, which means like devices attached to the network but without data transfer. So we knew that we had to fix this and that's why uh, several operators together with the GSMA introduced a new charging model specifically for NBLT, but it's now also being used for LTM and also going to be increasingly applied for, um, for SIM cards with even if it's uh, an LTE SIM card or LTE device. So it's called billing and charging evolution. The two key points you should um, know about this, it's, uh, it introduces the concept of access fees or attached fees, where um, an operator, uh, a roaming operator, receives a fee if a device is active at least once a month. And secondly, it's, it's based on bulk reporting to, uh, for, to, to allow a more cost-efficient invoicing. So here my message would be to every operator to also adopt and implement BCE as a sustainable solution for um, IoT roaming, not just NBRT roaming. So going to the next slide. So now we, now we need to talk about customer experience as well. So uh, the monetization might not be the customer problem, but what about the customer experience? So roaming itself, I must say, for NBRT and LTM works pretty well. However, there are still a few challenges that we as operators and vendors need to, need to overcome to really ensure a consistent, seamless user experience for our, our, our customers. It's very simple. If you are a developer and you uh, build a device and you test it in your domestic country and it works perfectly well, it doesn't mean that it worked well across the world. So what, what do we need to do about this? First, of course, we need global network coverage, of course, but then we also need to provide transparency on network availability. And as you might know, there's a deployment map provided by the GSMA online, which is very good. And it already includes some online coverage maps. So like specific coverage in, in specific countries in specific locations. And I think we need much more of that. So I will ask every operator to, to also in include and share their online coverage maps because customers, companies, uh, international with international IoT deployments needed needed really hard to really understand where exactly will you have coverage. Secondly, feature sets. So uh, of course th there needs to be a minimum standard of of what features are are being activated. And there's an uh, there's a GSMA deployment guide which is very helpful with which contains a minimum feature set. And we we need to need operators also to implement those minimum feature sets to to make sure the devices work. Um, and, and also not just implemented, but also transparency. So for international service continuity, we need, we need to know, every, every, every user needs to know whether a particular, for example, power saving function would work in a particular country. So here again, we are asking for, for, more, for providing more transparency. And then the developers also need to know how to properly develop devices for NBLT and LTM, because you can't just take the old code that works for 2G or 3G or LTE, um, you need to stick to the mobile IoT uh, application guidelines provided by the GSMA, but also by some operators like Deutsche Telekom. And then finally, um, we need for, for really highest service availability, we also need to um, implement some mechanisms in the chipsets and modules so to prevent harm from network. We are also working a lot with, um, with vendors um, and there's a, there's a very good international collaboration to make sure that uh, we protect the networks as, as good as we can. So that was about user experience, but uh, as I, next slide please. Um, as I already was suggesting, a, a good user experience is not just about the network, it's also about chipsets and modules. That's why we as Deutsche Telekom have set up a chipset and module certification program. It's, it's quite obvious that it's impossible for an operator to certify or check and certify every single IoT device in the world because there are zillions of them. But what we can do is certify the chipsets and modules 
which are somehow still which are some somehow still manageable for us. So we have certified around 200 IoT modules so far. Um, so sure every every um, every certified module assures that it's well interoperating and and performant on our networks. Um, which which will save developers a lot of time in choosing the right uh, module or making or checking which module works on every on which which network. Next slide, please. So talking talking about developers um, or talking about developing applications, it also takes usually takes a lot of time to to build prototypes and to check whether uh, how, how long the battery lifetime would be and whether um, what what the, about the performance of the device so that's another here's another example of a of great partnership between operators and and uh, and vendors it's uh, it's the IT solution optimizer in my, in my view it's the leading device planning and performance modeling tool for anyone developing and testing IoT devices and applications it's actually been launched at MWC uh, 2 years ago um, we started developing it around 2017, 2018, because we saw the need to digitize the development and support for, for our customers and to scale our know-how and provide IoT consulting globally. globally. So um, it's a digital twin modeling service, particularly at con um, for um, constrained battery-powered IoT devices. There's a very wide selection of components of around 60 vendor partners integrated with all the uh, related specs, and they are they are of course constantly updated, <clears throat> which allows service providers, manufacturers, developers to to virtually configure a device and applications, and then model the performance, like battery lifetime, and and model several scenarios to, for example, understand the trade-off between the frequency of messages and the battery lifetime, for example. And uh, you can also optimize your product designs for selected networks. So it's all a digital way of of uh, assisting assisting um, uh, customers, made possible by a great collaboration between um, operators and vendors. It's very popular. It's not just used by DT customers. There's actually a white labeled version for this being used by other mobile network operators, which I'm extremely glad about. So if you as an, oper if you, uh, as an operator would like to provide to your customers, uh, please, please let us know. So talking about developers, and I'm trying to advance the next slide. And um, and about standards, we need to we need to also promote standards because without standards, it's all going to be very cumbersome for anyone developing something. And I would even say that the lack of standards still slows down the traction of IoT um, and gives rise to different proprietary vendors of specific technologies where customers risk to be locked in. So therefore, we as Deutsche Telekom strongly support standards like like lightweight M two M and one M two M. And we feel that they are gradually gaining more momentum to allow for an open ecosystem agnostic to um, different technologies. So I won't go through the details in here, just the takeaways for you. Basically, Lightweight M2M is about a unified object and resource data model um, to allow standardized communication between devices and various platforms. And we as Deutsche Telekom are actively working with chipset suppliers um, and device manufacturers to, to test their lightweight M2M deployments and guarantee synergies. And secondly, one M2M is a general purpose standard that applies to all industry verticals. Um, it's also ensuring a high degree of reusability um, and, and interoperability across different applications, preventing silos. Yeah, so it allows uh, operate, uh, IoT developers to mix and match components from different vendors. And we are also one of the main contributors of the one M2M project, and of course, pushing this to make this a, like a truly global standard, and even incorporate the associated one M2M APIs into our, um, into our own architecture. So advancing one slide. So um, now we've covered networks and roaming and devices and applications standards now now let's have a few words on IOT developers um, I think um, of course they need help and advice and um, I think every everyone needs the possibility to learn from each other and we as mobile operators I think to be honest um, our services and our approach um, of the whole maybe not just operators the whole telco industry was so far not very easily accessible 
for uh, solution providers and small developers or, or developers from small companies. There was no platform to exchange know-how. Therefore, we as Deutsche Telekom established something uh, we call IoT creators, which is our channel specifically for IoT developers. So anyone who basically makes IoT solutions and it's, it's, an, open, it's an open platform that everyone can use. Um, everything at IoT creators can be ordered online without signing contracts and um, you can get started straight away. The highlights of IoT creators is that you would get an early access to IoT innovations. For example, um, you can test many things before they actually get launched. So uh, currently we're running a new SIM. Um, new SIM is our integrated SIM technology. I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, we, we test um, cloud-based cloud -based of a seller with our partner Polter and, and many companies at iotcreators.com or um, even we are we are piloting uh, LoRa gateways with LTM as well. so it's a disruptive collaboration between uh, 3GPP and non-3GPP players. It's all for free, all we ask uh, in return is get some feedback about those, those new products. It's developer friendly, so it's the connectivity is API based with lightweight M2M. It's a, it's a big supporting community with more than 3,000 registrations uh, across the world. There's a, there's a big documentation knowledge base, obviously always updated and growing. And uh, you can order free star tickets, um, which for which, uh, of which already uh, almost 2,000 have been shipped. So uh, please check it out. Um, as you can see, it's not just about Deutsche Telekom content or Deutsche Telekom products. It's actually a platform that, that benefits from the contribution of many players across the world. So, um, final, final point from my side: be um, in a final example of, a, of an international operation to uh, achieve something great is NuSIM. That's the integrated SIM specifically for IoT, specifically for low-cost devices. It's um, suitable for compact devices with a long battery life and a specific robustness requirements. Because the SIM, there's no separate SIM card anymore. It's it's all integrated in the module, in the, in the in the module or even chipset. There's an ecosystem of more than 30 companies currently developing new SIM products as we speak. The prototypes are already available. You can order them online at iotcreators.com for testing. So um, yeah, really, there are real new SIM device out there, and so not just nice videos about um, integrated SIMs. And um, we are there around more than 50 companies testing um, Newsom right now. Uh, people like uh, Camstrop for metering or Solitron for fill level monitoring. It's going to be commercially launched in the next quarter, like starting next quarter, starting tomorrow. But um, it's not going to be launched tomorrow. But there will be first modules, Newsom module com modules commercially available in uh, still in Q3. So again, another example of something that one company alone would not be able to achieve, which only works to a collaboration of, of different players. So this is, um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, just let me finish with some um, key takeaways, answering the slide. Um, three things I'd like you to take away from my little speech. So first of all, all players, MNOs and, and uh, solution and the software vendors must internationally work together to make IoT fly, other, fly otherwise it won't work. And I would also strongly recommend to use a body like the GSMA to act as a global platform for this. Second, I think every one of us should have an end-to-end -end view on IoT, which means not, not just uh, sending SIM cards to people, but like take an end-to-end -end view that, that includes everything that developers need to build IoT solutions. And thirdly, let's adopt and let's create more digital services to really scale and really make make uh, support efficient, yeah, to speed up device and solution development. Okay, thanks very much. I hope my points were and examples were helpful to you or even an inspiration. We as Deutsche Telekom are very happy to work with any one of you, so please get in touch with us. Thank you very much for your attention and keep on enjoying the conference. So thanks very much, Jens, if you can still hear us and see us. I'd also like to just say a big thank you to Jens because he's, he's very passionate about the roaming topic and he's actually been driving a lot of work within the IoT um, strategy group that I mentioned earlier on today. So next up, we're going to take a deep dive into one of the other areas of focus that we had uh, around trust. And we're going to have a short video from Sony um, and from Dima Fellman. Um, where they will 
they will discuss and dive into the area of the sec secure chipsets um, and how that's going to be the basis of, of the solutions of the future. So now I hope the technology will work and we should begin to see a video. Hello everyone from the sunny city of Tel Aviv. My name is Dima Feldman and I am a VP Product Management and Marketing at Sony Semiconductor Israel. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Avishai Shraga. I am the head of security technologies. At Sony, we are developing and manufacturing the low power and smallest IoT chipset solution using CAT M1 and NB technologies. In this talk, we would like to share with you our thoughts and insights about what kind of security suit is required for IoT devices, what is being taken care of today, what should be added in the near future, and how it can be addressed by the ecosystem. Or in other words, why we must be able to trust our things in order for IoT to fulfill its promise and how it can be achieved. Dima, can you share with us what are the security requirements for IoT devices you see in the market today? Today, the cellular IoT market enables seamless connectivity in a broad range of products, including wearable, telematic devices, logistic trackers, utility meters, smart city lightning, and many more applications. The range of security requirements we receive is probably as wide as the range of devices we support. Some device makers just want their devices to work, fully rely on a cellular network security. Some customers are asking for well-established security features like a secure boot, secure photo, and not storing credentials in the plain text. Others want to see their devices using latest security protocols and software versions in the market. In addition, there is a portion of more secure aware customers who ask to store credentials on a physical secure element. There are very few highly sophisticated customers who see security not as a feature, but as a holistic approach to a system design. Those companies would typically have a very solid security knowledge and a security organization to support those requirements. As you probably know, many of the security ecosystem players strongly invest into bringing security to smartphones. This is the foundation of our ability to trust devices that hold or have access to a majority of, of our personal assets, as well as payment cards information. Smartphone manufacturers and ecosystem work hard to protect devices from malicious applications, close potential security holes in the application, and provide inter-application security in the rich operating system. Some companies also guarantee that it would be very difficult and even impossible for a third party or even a government agency to get access to the data. So, zero device security is fairly mature with lots of players and thousands of many years invested. A question to be asked, can we reuse this knowledge in the cellular IoT devices? This could be great if cellular IoT devices and cellular phones were similar, however, this is not the case. Perhaps the only similarity between smartphones and cellular IoT is the cellular connectivity itself. The use cases are different, the capabilities are different, the cost structure is different, the supply chain is different, the diversity of devices is different, the trust model is different, and clearly the nature of threats and threat model are different, and therefore different security concepts are required. So how cellular IoT devices are different from the smartphones? The majority of them perform a well-defined function. For example, door lock will be only responsible for locking the door. It won't allow to enable or expand the existing functionality. Many of the devices are very low cost, relatively simple, and do not run rich operating system. They can be part of the critical infrastructure, like utility smart meters, or perform a critical function for the service operator, like a control of the e-scooters. They are very limited in terms of compute resources and power. They are designed to last in field from weeks to 10 or even 20 years. And in most cases, there are no human operator next to them. They are left without human supervision in the field. If this is not enough, many of the devices are battery only operated. Therefore, the ability to perform updates and to monitor the system health is limited. Avishai, as you see, 
The challenge is totally different. IoT device service provider have a different headache. Their main concerns is about serviceability and ability to guarantee function and quality of service over the device expected lifespan. This is a very big challenge taking into account multiple disciplines involved. From a security point of view, what device makers need to do in order to ensure serviceability? Thanks, Dima. This is a very good question. In order to ensure serviceability from a security point of view, we need to first identify the threats on it. And performing threat analysis on an IoT device will reveal that the assets and threats on the serviceability of such device are different than those of smartphones. The difference is mainly derived from two reasons. The first is that the assets are in the physical world, sensors and actuators. And the second is that the device is unattended. One trivial example of such asset can be the battery of a battery operated device like a gas meter. The threat on this asset may be draining it much faster than planned by causing the device to misbehave. In a smartphone, this is not a critical threat as you can easily charge the battery. So on a high level, we can say that the assets we need to protect in order to ensure serviceability of an IoT device are the sensing data the device provides need to be trusted for integrity, authenticity, origin, order, freshness, and context. The commands the device receives need to be trusted in the same way. Identity and access control need to be protected. The device need to be trusted to behave as and only as designed. The availability of connectivity of the device has to be ensured. And in some cases, also the confidentiality of data and algorithm need to be taken care of. Some of the threats are similar to the ones in the phone space, like the threat on connectivity. In this case, it makes sense to reuse the proven industry solution like the SIM. And we are actually reusing SIM technology for IoT, but it required to evolve in order to address the nature of the threat of IoT. One major difference, as Dima mentioned, is that in the case of the smartphone, the user is playing an important role in the ability to trust the SIM. The user makes sure the SIM is not removed and there is no additional access to the SIM interface like wires getting out of the SIM slot. For IoT, in the absence of a user, the evolvement to integrated SIM form factor addresses it by making the SIM non-removable and the interface inaccessible. In general, we can say that the user acts as an important trust anchor in the smartphone space, not only for connectivity, but also for many other assets, like identity by fingerprint, approval of actions, and many other examples. For IoT, in the absence of a user, we need another trust anchor. But IoT space trust challenges are even bigger. A typical IoT device includes multiple functional domains owned by different business entities that we must not assume trust each other. A simple example will be the connectivity domain, the device management domain, and the business logic domain. So in order to create trusted things, we need to make the device trustworthy without the user and establish the foundations for separate trust domains to the different entities. So how can we provide it? The trust anchor we have on an IoT device is the hardware itself. Trusting the hardware can replace the trust of the user in many of the cases, as done in the case of integrated SIM. And the combination of the hardware root of trust with trusted software can establish the trust anchors in the rest of the cases. Software is much more flexible and upgradable than hardware in providing trust and security. So one may ask why software is not enough? The answer is very simple. In order for the software to provide it, we need to make sure that the correct software is running on the correct device. And the only way to do so is by ensuring it with the hardware, which is not flexible and can be trusted to behave as designed. So using a hardware root of trust establishes the trust anchor. How should we handle the trust domains? 
The answer here is separate hardware root of trust for each domain. By decoupling the hardware root of trust, we allow each business entity to have its own trust domain, while not blocking the ability to have a couple of domains owned by the same entity. The coupling of the domains today will most likely be done by dedicated and separated hardware subsystems, but in the future, it may converge to a single subsystem that can hold multiple hardware root of trust and can be trusted by the industry to provide perfect isolation between them. So Dima, what is your view on where we should put our focus and attention to secure IoT devices? Yeah, thank you, Avishai, for the insightful overview of the security threats and what needs to be protected. Properly securing the device generated data is of the highest importance for me. Looking on the typical electricity meter as an example, which can cost few tens to hundreds of dollars, we learn that it will generate over $40,000 bills in its lifetime. From a business perspective, we must give tools for our customers and the utility company to trust the data collected by the meter to generate accurate billing. While securing connectivity with eSIM and iSIM is a very important, and we spend a lot of time on this topic, my first important takeaway, we must properly secure the data first. This leads me to the second important takeaway. Due to the high level of integration in the silicon design technology today, the majority of the IoT devices are built around cellular modem or system on chip. Devices becoming so simple that you only need to add antenna, sensor, and the battery to the cellular modem. To wrap it up, cellular modems are the common and the often the only chipset in the device. Adding hardware-based secure element to the modem is the most efficient way to guarantee high level of data security and the data integrity in the IoT devices. We thank you all for being with us and thank you, Avishai. Thank you, Dima, and thank you, audience. We hope to meet you all in the next MWC in person. Okay, now we're just going to move on away from the individual uh, presentations to hopefully a bit more interactive. We've got a number of panel sessions which we're going to have now. We're going to, the first panel session up next is going to be moderated by Sylvia from the GSMA um, intelligence team, and it's going to be on roaming and global partnerships. So if I could ask Sylvia and the panel to join us on stage. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be here. We can take off our mask, we've been told, because we're far away <laughs> from each other. Jens, good to see you. Um, so, welcome to this year's Mobile IoT Summit. My name is Veka Shish. I'm the Principal Analyst for IoT and Enterprise at GSM Intelligence. And we have a great content and a great panel joining us today. So we have, going from the left, yes, left, we have Andres Escribano, new business and industry for Dot Zero Director at Telefonica. We have Nicola Demour, Director for Technology Partnership Development at Sierra Wireless. We have Marco Vielts, <laughs> Senior Vice President for EMEA and Asia Pacific from Car Wireless. And last but not least, we have Jens. Oleyak, uh, Head of New Access Technologies from Deutsche Telekom IoT. And we can see Jens here, and we try to look at him there, so you know we're not <laughs> ignoring him. So we only have half an hour um, to discuss the topic of LPWA roaming and global partnerships. So just, just starting us off, this year MWC is different, right? We will be sitting very close, much closer together, we wouldn't be wearing masks. And, what sort of impact COVID-19 has had on mobile IoT? Um, could you highlight the differences in terms of verticals, regions? And maybe i start with you, Andres, because we, we've discussed this before, just to start us off. OK. Uh, thank you for, com for, for coming and this invitation. Let me uh, put the focus first. I have here a little bit noise. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
I have a little complex situation. Um, I think, uh, for my point of view, we have two different focus. One is what's happening with the uh, regions. In general, for example, in Latin America, we are starting the, the, the adoption of this kind of new technologies because of concept approach, etc. They are limited effect, but in other regions, for example, in Europe, where we are launched the massification of use of these kind of uh, technologies. We have two, two questions. First is, obviously, there are li limited deployment of the project that is on ongoing. And the second is the availability for the chipset that you use in general for the uh, use of sensor and so on. It means is the combination of both are a delay a little bit the project that we have ongoing. Uh, in general, if you're thinking in the smart, smart metering projects, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we have several complications for, for the COVID and they are limited in this part, in the geographical for, for Europe and for the availability of the chipset that is necessary for the sensors. Definitely, and, and we have actually module manufacturer with us as well. So what would you say to that? What sort of changes have you seen? Yeah, so, so it's true that obviously so COVID-19 had put a strain on the supply chains and on, on everything that's hardware related. We've heard about some, uh, some manufacturing plants in the automotive industry, for example, being slowed down or, or completely stopped because of uh, component shortages. But uh, I would say that the good news is also that uh, it's also because there's a strong demand. I mean, COVID-19 has been a plague, uh, but also it has revealed the strength uh, uh, of being able to remotely manage uh, infrastructure, being able to remotely monitor and control a lot of different assets in the field. Uh, fortunately, the uh, mobile IoT networks had started their rollout well before COVID-19, so we could see some benefits. And as we stand now, I think that the networks um, are being rolled out uh, faster than ever. We can see that, especially in Europe, I would say, uh, potentially so in, in, in other regions, uh, maybe it had been rolled out a little bit earlier. We've been talking about mobile IoT for a number of years now, yes. Yes. but what we can see now is that there's a, a, a sustained demand for it, and uh, we, can, we can finally roll out projects so uh, it's looking uh, quite positive, I would say. That's, that's good to hear. And, and actually, you know, we're talking about starting the rollout of the network and so on. But even when you think about regular IoT, not, not mobile IoT, there's still lots of challenges. So according to our enterprise and focus survey, the top three challenges is integration, especially with IT, um, security, and, and data privacy, as well as cost. So, um, what sort of challenges do you see when it comes to deploying mobile IoT? And, and more importantly, what can be done to overcome those challenges? And maybe, Jens, we start with you. Could you get us started on that? And you, you, you touch on some of those during your presentation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I mean, of course, um, questions, what perspective are we talking about? Uh, of course, there are uh, moment of mobile IoT. From an MNO perspective, it's always a big project. But, um, Lots of things that can go wrong, but um, if, you, if you look at uh, globally, I think um, I'm, I'm, I, th I think there's still, still a slow deployment of mobile IoT for by other MNOs, um, maybe perhaps uh, to unclear business cases for them. So uh, then there still need to be more MNOs who are convinced that mobile IoT is uh, is good for them. Of course, yeah, then there are technical keeping problems um, for, for customers as well. As well. Maybe three more things that are maybe not that obvious. Uh, one is the missing standardized end-to-end -end stack, which I kind of touched on um, in my presentation. I think that at, le at least initially, secondly, there was no vibrant ecosystem. Uh, if you look at, for example, Laura One, they are they have much smaller players and, and maybe less money, but they, they are more successful in creating, creating hype um, for that technology. And, and thirdly, um, I also touched this, an end to end view of the whole customer journey in IoT. So, customers, developers need more support from the beginning to the end in developing the IoT solutions. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and very important when, when we think about it um, is that when we look at the end, end to end view, being an orchestrator. I think we just came back from the panel when Romy was talking about end-to-end -end orchestration and, and trying to become that. What sort of trends do you see? Did, did you see actually 
more challenges or, or less challenges? Could you, could you walk us through some of that? Well, let, let me first touch upon the, uh, the fact of the end-to-end -end view, right? So because we, we tend to talk about connectivity, uh, but the end user doesn't think about connectivity. He doesn't even think about IoT. He yeah. thinks about the solution, and that has to work. And if we think about connectivity itself, it should simply work out of the box. It should be simple, and that's the objective that we have in an industry to, uh, to make it that way. And that's how we work with our customers to simplify their journey uh, in IoT. And by doing that, um, or in, in the, let's say, the, the aim of doing that, we believe that orchestration is a very big element. Because if you think about an IoT solution, not only from a technical perspective, but in general, there are so many elements that uh, you have to be pieced together that orchestration is essential. It's not about the separate elements themselves, it's how about you orchestrate all those elements to a solution that helps the customer in their IoT journey. So we, we totally believe that um, we should overcome the technical restrictions, like if you think about LPWA, um, the, roaming, uh, the roaming is still not seamless. Um, if you think about, let's say, the, the, the power save mode that, are, that is available in some countries, some networks, it's not ubiquitous, it's, it's implemented differently. Uh, all those things we have to resolve to make it seamless for our customers. Definitely, and I think I hand to you, Nicola. You've been doing quite a lot of work with, with GSM to, say, to pretty much address some of those challenges, so it's, it's not all bad. Could you tell us a bit more well, about the challenges and how to solve them? Yeah, so, so I think in terms of challenges, it's true that so these technologies are not 100% new, but they are quite young still. So there's a number of challenges, but uh, the, the, the positive side is that as an ecosystem, uh, I, I think as an industry, so module makers, network manufacturer, uh, uh, network operators, um, so under the umbrella of GSMA, uh, and especially, so uh, um, there's a couple of groups, but I can think of these uh, 5G IoT strategy groups, so GSMA has done a, a great work uh, uniting key stakeholders uh, in this group to address exactly these uh, challenges that we just talked about. Uh, in particular, so how roaming can work seamlessly, not just in terms of having the data access, but how also the services in terms of uh, more efficient uh, power consumption, extended coverage, all of these things, how they can be, um, well, seamlessly addressed from a user perspective so that whichever SIM card they're using, it works pretty much everywhere uh, and fulfill the roaming promise. So, so there's this, uh, there's also the impact of the network. So. So there's been a lot of good work being done backstage, I would say, that the consumers are, are, are starting to feel the benefit from. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. There's still a lot of work to be done. There will always be a lot of work to be done. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy about the progress that uh, we've done uh, with the industry together. And, and it's quite a new technology. We tend to forget it's, it's pretty new. But going to turn to you, Andreas, actually, um, we're talking about mobile IoT in the context of 5G. And we have to remember that NBIT LTM is part of the 5G family and will be supported with standalone 5G. So when we talk, when we prepare for the panel, we talk about um, integration and, and 2G, because, you know, 5G, 2G, we still have 2G, we have 3G. So, so when you think about customers connecting their devices to a network, they cannot think about it the same way as they think about 2G. Is that right? It's correct. It's, it's something of, I think it's one very basic mistake, you know, when you try to do the things in, a, in the same way that you are tradition, using the traditional technology like a 2G or 3G. It's, it's not... Uh, for the first time, we have a technology for the communication that is really designed for connected things. And we need to take the advantage of the capability that this network offers. But means that it's not exactly the same that we are using in 2G or 3G. It's necessary to adjust several parameters. You need to design the solution to optimize uh, different uh, elements, like a battery duration. You need to decide it or analyze where, or identify where is located the device. It's not the same in the floor that in a minus, floor, minus three floor. You need to identify, for example, the data that is necessary to be sent and when it's necessary to be sent. It's not always, always on connection. Uh, we need to think in that, uh, for example, when you are designing this kind of sensor, probably you, you put on field for years. It's necessary to take care of these little things. At least it's redesigning a concept, the, the solution that probably is, is just running in 2G and, and take the advantage of use other kind of technologies, design it to be more efficient 
more cheaper, more, more uh, let's say, uh, adjusted for a different use case. And this is for us critical. In, general, in several uh, cases, uh, we discovered that really the, 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 this mistake is in a very basic concept. You know, is you connect it and the, the battery is dropped dramatically in weeks when it's designed to, to maybe uh, prepare something like a year, so to has a duration for years. You know, this happened. You know. Yeah, and, and, and think when we talk about mobility, or as we call it, license of WA in, in GSM intelligence, we're talking about NBIT and LTEM. And um, so in terms of preferences, there used to be this big camp, you know, oh, I am NBIT, I'm LTEM, but now we're seeing there's a bit of a difference. You know, there's different use cases for different technologies. So um, there's, this is a quite a complex question. So do you see, do you have any preference? And then whether or not, there is actually a regulatory env environment that is propagating use of one technology over the other. What I mean by that is that 2G, 3G network um, shutdowns to, to future-proof enterprise investment. And maybe Mark, I'll start with you. Yeah, so, so for us as core, we deploy managed scale solutions with our customers and just get things to work. So for us, there's no preference, right? It just yeah. has to work. Um, and even whether it's licensed or unlicensed, it doesn't matter too much. Although I must say, um, let's say the cellular networks, the public cellular networks are doing a good job providing the connectivity for our customers. Um, so it's all about the use case. Um, if you think about the number of use cases that we've come across over the last two decades, about 10,000, that's enormous. And there's no one size that fits all. So it has to be tailored around each and every situation. Um, if you think about difference between LTM and MBIOT, well, there are use cases that are specifically tailored around MBIOT that simply, does, in terms of coverage, for example, deep indoor coverage is better for MBIOT. Uh, others work better with LTM. Uh, so it's very, very dependent on the use case that we come across uh, where we apply the technology. Um, also, uh, we still use the older technologies to, uh, to go through the transition, uh, something that is forgotten about. We think about the end solution, which will be there in a few years and everything will be seamless. But but our customers are deploying right now. So how do you make sure that you leverage both technologies, the current one and the older ones, in a way that the customer gets most value out of his solution? Yeah, it is all about value. And like, not only about connecting things, about value that you get from the data that's being collected, that you can change business processes. And, and I think, Andres, you know, data, and there's a very different way of, of, of data transfer of megabytes. doesn't make sense anymore, right? Charging per, per megabyte that's, when it comes to mobility. That's correct. That's correct. So, uh, following the rationale, I think it's more important thinking in the use case. Now it's important to use uh, the, the right approach for the technology and not to use the technology like that. Means uh, here we're not talking about the traditional uh, plants are we talking about uh, mega or, or gigabytes that you transfer here the important thing is the use case and the characteristics that you need to deploy in the network to comply this use case there are different approaches that is completely different you use something for asset tracking or metering or for for other kind of sensors that you use in agro is 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 the combination of these kind of things why how and when you need to transfer the data is the key question, you know, and it helps a lot if you analyze this, uh, these things before launch the project, because in general, the, the other, other challenge is uh, use the right approach for the right proportion, not, not thinking that it's flat and all things happen if you connect it and pay gigabytes. This is something that is different in this kind of technologies. And you guys, is it uh, that the customers just want 2G that is going to last longer and it's cheaper? <laughs> well, yeah, so, so this was actually, uh, we're talking a lot about, about use cases. And one of the first use cases we really saw, especially for LTEM, was essentially customers just wanted what they were used to, really. Yes, so yeah. 2G, uh, just not 2G, something that would last longer than the 2G uh, sunset. And, and cheaper, and really a good portion of those early customers were not necessarily looking for the true value add, so extended coverage, lower power consumption. So, so th this was and still is to some extent a part of our customers, but, but fortunately there are different use cases, and, uh, and I think it's very important in this transition phase to offer some things that you mentioned it, so it's definitely 5G, um, uh, compliant 5G proof, part of 5G, 
and, and in, in terms of hardware, so to offer versatile hardware so that can serve, so LTM. Take an example, you'll have a metering application doing narrowband IoT because it's very static, not much data, but then all of a sudden you want to do a remote software upgrade because there's a security patch. All of a sudden you need a bigger pipe, and so maybe you'll need LTM. And so having the hardware already in place that does support LTM, narrowband IoT, and still 2G for most of the European coverage is important. And then, depending on the use case, you can, uh, you can send data. And uh, as Andres was saying, um, uh, not necessarily charging per megabyte. I mean, at Sierra, we also have this network operator, so service in, in that we sell. And in, in one of our uh, latest uh, offers does not charge per megabyte. We charge per message, because that's, that's really what the customer is interested in to see how much information in terms of piece of information they, they can get out of the, uh, their deployment. Definitely. And Jens, coming back to you, um, so you've been deploying NBIT and LTM, so starting from 2017, but that's NBIT, and then you started with LTM in, in 2020. So why, why do you think LTM started to pick up, and why did you actually go for LTM too? I think to us, or to me, it was always obvious that we need both. Um, so back in 2015, 2016, we were, we were asking ourselves whether we should go for cellular technologies like NBLT and LTM, or even go for lower one or six-box, because cellular, BGPV. Uh, for NBLT, we saw the high immediate need, because it was it is covering a use case area that couldn't be covered by anything else, by 2G and 3G. And five years ago, 2G was still around. Um, so it's just it's just a thing of life cycle. Uh, so LTM is, uh, is getting more popular uh, due to the 2G 3G shutdown. Also, uh, as people uh, said, some some people figure out that their device actually needs more uh, need to send more data than initially thought, and rather than sending megabytes uh, with NPLT, they go for LTM. But there's still a huge market for NPLT, and of course since more mature from, from our perspective, uh, from our deployments, with any much more uh, NBLT customers than LTM customers. But we definitely need both. We cannot use NBLT and CAT1, and we cannot uh, use just LTM and not NBLT. So we have both, and I think we uh, customers also need both. Definitely. And, and I think we need to start going towards the, the topic, the roaming. So mobility, roaming. So there are still challenges. And so let's, let's discuss some of the barriers and challenges to, to realizing global um, mobility roaming. And, and back to the roaming question, and actually we've been talking about very different needs. So we, we, we can't think of mobility the same way as we think about 2G so, or 3G. It's very different. So is there also a need to introduce the new charging models? So not only roaming, we think about charging. So, so I'll let you this, this discuss that. We have probably about five minutes to talk about this. So um, I hand it to Jens, who is, um, you've been doing quite a bit of work on, on mobile IoT roaming, correct? We're talking about charging between operators or charging to customers? Sorry? Are you, are you talking about uh, Charging, wholesale charging between operators or both actually. And so we're talking about both. So mixing and matching the topics. Yeah, so as I said in my speech, the classic charging models for roaming don't work for IoT because of the small data volumes. That's why PPE between charging models has and as I said, I repeat, I think everyone, every operator should raise this. Uh, which, which uh, somebody said it's about use cases, so the value is not about sending bytes or megabytes, it's about, uh, about connecting objects and making sure an object is actually connected. That's the big value, not, not whether it consumes 500 kilobytes or one megabyte a month. That's, that's one thing. And then, of course, the retail uh, models for, for customers also need to be more or less in line with the, with the wholesale models. So. Yeah, what, what can I say? Um, we as operators always hope to um, be profitable here and make sure that we uh, we get we get our costs our wholesale costs reimbursed. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, Andres, um, we discussed that um, business-to-business roaming is a very different approach to, to regular roaming, and there's a need for actual different, there's a different technical and regulatory implications related to that. Could you, could you tell us a bit more about that, so that you have issues with numbering and so on? Yeah, it's, it's following several rationale that Jens explained. Uh, here we're talking about the use case. We are not talking the mega, and it's more complex for the telcos reaching agreement because really it's necessary to fix the use case that is necessary to support, you know? And, and there are other, current, other kind of parameters that is the quality of service that is necessary to take care of the, the reaction or the service level agreement. There, there are several things that is necessary to be fixed and it's necessary to be fixed per use case. And this is the key question, you know? Because it's not the same that the agreements that we have today up and running that is based in megabytes or gigabytes. It's simple, you know? Uh, we, we automatize these kind of things. When you're talking about the massive IoT, specifically when you're talking internal of things, the chip is, ch is changed a little bit because the use cases are more related, as you mentioned, in the B2B. And here the use case is crucial because here is associated with business impact if you are not able to comply with these kind of requirements. It's more than specifically the charging mode. It's, it's how it's possible to guarantee that the service is up and running as, as is defined in the first moment, you know? And this is complex when you don't have uh, the, uh, the relation, direct relation with the customer, you know, and, and it's something that we need to work a lot because it's not simple. We believe that is the only way to make something uh, reality, these kind of technologies, but today is a challenge that we have because it's necessary to fix it, the use case, and we're talking about several of them, and the rules of engagement for everyone, for uh, one of them, you know. Nico, can I, can I go to you in terms of the clarification on B2B roaming for mobility, which is even different to, to roaming between B2B. Could you? There's a lot of work that actually is being done with NGSMA that, that, that you lead on that as well. Yes, uh, indeed. So, so, there, so there's a dedicated group within GSMA, so on, on wholesale uh, agreements and solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of work that's been done up until, I would say, two, three years ago. This group was very much focused on, on business travelers, really, and consumer uh, connectivity. Now, the, the topic of mobile IoT, especially for B2B, has been raised and introduced in a group. There's a lot of work that's been done. I think there's still a lot of work still to be done, especially in terms of, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, and, and uh, I'll let Mark comment on that, but MVNOs do have a role to play here in the ecosystem. And, and so uh, traditional network operators, such as Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, and the big ones, there's a complementarity there. And, and going to market to address these mobile IoT use cases, um, there's a, a lot of uh, trust to be built in the fact that uh, there's enough room for everyone. And Jens was talking about uh, reimbursing uh, the, the network investments. So value need and, and uh, can be shared between uh, access networks and, and connectivity providers. So. Uh, there's a lot of good work done at GSMA, but I think uh, we still have some way to go so that roaming is, is really a, a reality for customers so that even B2B customers have a freedom of choice. Um, we can see in the consumer space there was regulation at European level. Some may argue that we could have a, at least a clarification of the regulation for B2B use cases because it's a little bit of a gray zone as of today. and so. More clarity on that would definitely help uh, the business to, to, to thrive, I think. Marco, you did Yeah, yeah. For, for my end, just to take the customer's perspective again, I think, um, well, first of all, obviously, we have been uh, piggybacking on 2G for a long time, and the customers have gotten used to that, right? So that's a kind of reference uh, that they have right now, and we have to deal with that. So I think everybody understands if you look uh, under the bonnet what is happening is just for the customers very complicated again because all of a sudden there are additional charges think about the truck that is going to europe that hits all kinds of networks and all from the old networks it get it get charges those charges are actually way too high for the use case so uh, for us and for our customers um, let's say that 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 price that changing price model is, is a challenge that we have to work with, especially now in the transition again, uh, where some, uh, some agreements already have those charges, others have not. So it's, it's not a level playing field from that perspective, and it's very different across the industry right now. So that's, that's a challenge that we have to address uh, together with the customers and our, our partners. 
So once I have it here, we actually received a question from the audience related to the future role of uh, low powered area and UICC playing in it. So um, will new remote supervision standards make, make it more uh, cost effective for NBIT? Sorry, could you repeat? So how do you see the future of low, low powered area and ESIM? Oh, that's an interesting topic. Um, we yeah, only so have a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so e e eSIM, e e I'll, I'll keep it short. eSIM um, is obviously a very important uh, technology that truly unlocks IoT. Um, I think everybody agrees on that by now. It has taken a while for everybody to come on the same page, but I think everybody agrees on that right now, uh, and it will bring value to everybody. The challenge with, uh, with low power and eSIM is that uh, the standards, at least M2M -M standards, have been based on a kind of push of the, uh, of the profile where an SMS is being sent to the device. Well, first of all, a lot of the devices or the technologies don't support SMS. So how do you get that message to the device? That's one thing. Secondly, uh, those devices are um, generally um, uh, in sleep mode, so the SMS doesn't get received. So all those things make it almost impossible to use eSIM with, uh, with, with low power solutions right now, although some proprietary solutions exist. Uh, fortunately, in the new standards that will be resolved uh, in the new IoT standard for, uh, for eSIM, um, there will be a pull mechanism where the device actually pulls the, uh, the, the profile to the device where it's needed. So that will help a lot. And in the end, that technology will allow to truly come to the promise of eSIM, which is a single, a single SIM for the lifetime of the device. And, and I think we're not there just yet, uh, but we're very close. We, we unfortunately running out of time, so in a few words, um, we, we discussed quite a lot of challenges, barriers, we're getting there. It's still quite a new technology. It is part of 5G family, we have to remember that, and it has to be future-proof, some of the things have to be fixed. So what sort of raw ecosystem and different partners working together can, can do to stimulate the adoption, actually align the technical requirements with enterprise use cases? Let's not forget the use cases. Maybe, Jens, starting with you. A few words. Yeah, so again, repeating a bit my presentation, <laughs> how we uh, player who can actually do it um, from a, from a customer user perspective. There are always many components involved. Um, so software players, hardware manufacturers, module chipset manufacturers, uh, operators. Not even a single operator can do it. But we need to keep on working together, establish standards. We need to stick to the standards. We need to provide transparency on the networks. Um, I can give you a lot of examples of, of use cases, but I think it's, it's basically all the same. Companies need roaming. They're not served by a single operator in a single country. They, they want their devices to work across the world, and that only works with collaboration. Anybody else? I think, Nika, we should mention the work that 5G IoT yeah, strategy does. Yeah, I, I think uh, we must realize that as an industry, I mean, uh, the cellular industry is one of the very few industries that has managed over 30 years to bring up that ecosystem under uh, such organizations as uh, uh, GSM originally, and then uh, 3GPP, GSMA plays a very important role. So, so you can have a Samsung phone connect to an Ericsson base station, work on the Telefonica network and talk all the way down to just another phone. So very interoperable, so that, that's a key value and that's value to the customers, uh, B2B and B2C. So I think we must continue to, to build on that because it's a, a truly important asset of our industry. Definitely, and we are unfortunately out of time. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today remotely and in person. We enjoyed the panel. I hope the audience enjoyed it too. If you have any questions, do reach out. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Sylvia in the panel, thanks so much for such a great conversation. So now we're just going to move into the next phase. So I showed those three pillars at the start of the session today, and we're going to move into the enablement area and, and start to discuss some of the work that GSMA has been doing and the ecosystem as a whole in the area of eSIM uh, and iSIM. So the panel today will be about how or giving how 5G will give, um, sorry, how eSIM will give 5G IoT 
a head start in terms of the products and the services that they're developing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Gloria, who is the eSIM director from the GSMA. Hi. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Just come in, please, my panelists. Well, welcome. Please. So, hi, everyone. Welcome to this panel on Given 5G IoT a Head Start. We have with us a few panelists today that we'll get to meet in a second. So many believe, as we've heard before from Huawei, the 5G technology is the technology capable of actually connecting the high volume of devices that are expecting to be connected in the future. But what about eSIM IoT devices? We've heard about eSIM in previous panels. And how can eSIM and iSIM give actually a head start to IoT 5G? Well, these and many other questions could be replied today during this panel. And for that, we have with us GND, Sariot, Netlink, and Sony Semiconductors to help us. So, starting with the introductions of those with me uh, in the room. So, please, GND. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Andreas Morowitz. I'm working with Giesig and Deviant, I'm responsible for the strategic product management, focusing on lifecycle management services. Um, for me, it is eSIM management is really with me at the beginning since about 2009 when we kicked off the first eSIM management work with three main MNOs, and that was the beginning of this journey within the industry. Pleasure for me being here and talking about the capabilities and, and, and opportunities we have with this technology in a, in a 5G IoT landscape. Thank you. Welcome, Andreas. David, please. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dario Galini. I'm the CEO of Zariot. We provide secure connectivity to uh, enterprises. Um, and it's wonderful to be part of this ecosystem. Um, I think that eSIM, iSIM is going to allow us to deploy connectivity a lot easier and a lot faster uh, than we have to date. Thank you. So for those with us uh, remotely, we're going to start with Gary from LetLink. Please, Gary. Yes, hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Wade. I've been working uh, since the original SIM cards that developed. That's way back in 1992. Um, I contributed quite heavily to it. And then I co-founded a startup designed to the de facto uh, SIM tool for the whole industry. I've worked with Telefonic O2 for many years on a number of technologies, SIM and IoT, and then the SMA traction, and you used the specification for end to end. After that, I was tasked with the specification for consumer. But it's great to see those specifications and standards. Today, I had strategy, uh, but I finally get a chance to actually and not just the Thank you, Gary. And finally, Avisei from Sony Semiconductor Central, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Avisei from Semiconductor Central, the name of the head of security. The technology is the ISIM activity, the other security activities of our product. I'm happy to be part of this. Thank you. Okay, let's start with our first question, Ben. So it is says, and we've heard in, in previous keynotes, that the adoption of 5G is going to accelerate the, the deployments of new IoT connected devices. But Gary, what are in your views the most significant changes on the adoption of 5G IoT devices? Okay, well, I mean, to answer that question, I think it's worth recapping on 5G actually. I've heard some people say that 5G is just another G. And that's wrong. It's not just another G. It's the next evolved G. It's the culmination of all the learning we gained from 4G 
together with the implementation of everything that we can reasonably determine about the future of mobile. Remember how we felt when we experienced it the first time? Uh, we were on 2.5G and 3G was great. And I had that 3G today in the light of great experience at the forge. And 5G raises that bar again. Higher this time. It's way more than just enough G. For IoT applications, it's absolute here. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. You famous 5G triangle IoT session and three usage scenarios at each corner. If you remember at the top, this gives you ten times faster than 4G. That's great for collection of people tell or transmission. I don't know, all high def video feeds. Then in one bottom corner, low latency patients. And that's ideal for mission critical like mobile surgery, factory, and autonomous vehicles that we've heard. And then there's massive machine type. And that's perfect for the tens of devices that we're going to see, like sensors. These devices don't transmit a lot of data. We do to be energy, uh, sorry, energy efficient. So they're likely to be running on batteries. What amazes me is that 5G can handle a IoT devices within one square. What is that? So 5G is a gift to us because you can place any current IoT application within that triangle and leverage those three usage scenarios. That's before we get to things like private networks and of course what we're talking about today. So I think to answer your question, Gloria, for five G, I think it's all about. I got it. Thanks. Well, we cut out from time to time, so I'm not sure I get that last question. <laughs> but we're gonna get now um, back to David. And what do you think the most significant changes in five G IoT are? Um, I think from the mobile network point of view, it might be around cost. Um, you know, so the ability for the network to recycle a lot of the resources that, that it has. So because there's no actual need to pre-allocate, you know, an eSIM kind of environment to all of the, the IMSIs immediately, um, we don't need to pre-provision anything. And as devices, you know, are not being used, et cetera, we can, you know, release those resources back into the core network and that reduces things like licensing costs for uh, the, the core network. Thanks David. So you may remember how GSM launched back in, in 2014 the first ECM M2 specification actually was the first one allowing the remote capability of downloading profiles also called operator subscriptions into IoT devices and, and in the IoT market, that was a, a significant milestone because it helps eliminating this need of physically switching the ESM um, as well as switching when you were going to change from one network operator or another from one cellular connectivity uh, to another. And it actually significantly reduces the complexity of getting IoT devices connected globally. Um, so, so now that 5G is a reality, Avishai, how can eSIM and iSIM open new opportunities for 5G IoT? Is there any room for opportunities? Yes, thank you, Gloria. So uh, I think that, do you hear me with echo? Sorry. If you, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think novel SIM technology uh, open new opportunities for uh, 5G or for cellular in general. Uh, I'm sorry, give me a few seconds to adjust my uh, audio. Go ahead, I'm gonna go. I with cannot Andrea. hear myself. Don't worry, go I'm gonna to go the with next Andreas. One. <laughs> so Andreas, how can ISIM and ISIM open new 5G IoT opportunities? Um, I think they, they by itself can open a lot of opportunities. IoT itself, in my, in my view, 
it brings a, a really uh, several ecosystems together, ecosystem of, of MNOs, of connectivity management, of OEMs producing devices, um, and all of them jointly, in, in my view, IoT build the biggest machine, actually, what, what mankind ever will build. Everything interlinked, everything sending data, um, allowing to analyze these data in a, in a variety. And opportunities for several players, I would see, um, first one is there is an opportunity of ownership from connectivity devices, root of trust devices, maybe may be, uh, eSIMs, iSIMs, which allow to operate and execute uh, secure operations, um, such as any kind of um, um, TLS-based IoT safe applications. But it also opens a, a second opportunity which is the dynamic management of connectivity. So dynamic management of connectivity in an early phase of manufacturing a device, so in fab manufacturing, but also managing connectivity when devices will be deployed in the field, but also talking about end of life of, of devices. And here, as you just said, the GSMA has created a, a really solid fundament together with all the players who worked on the specification to already be in a position to manage connectivity, for example, in the consumer environment. And just take a look from, from the GSMA market intelligence figures. Um, by end of last year, 175 MNOs in 69 countries launched eSIM management commercially. And I think this, this is so important to, to have this understanding of a commercial deployment. What would that mean? And the question for, is, for sure is, what is, does this mean what we, the learnings we have done in consumer? What would that mean for, for IoT market segment? And to answer that one, and we have seen that in, in presentation um, uh, from, from Huawei, for example, is I would separate in three categories. The first category is really um, these, these 4G, 5G based applications, which will be, according to GSMA market intelligence, about 1.3 billion uh, connections in the year 26. The second one, these mass IoT, another 2.5 billion devices uh, leveraging NB-IoT or CUT-M. And the third one, which is these private networks, all of a sudden that someone as an enterprise has the opportunity to own a network. And I think that, that is really opening a lot of opportunities for, for leveraging what we already know in these new environments. And for sure, there's also some, some learnings what we had that technologies like, like SMS um, m might not be valid for all these networks or that we have to have an, a, a relatively fast interaction with a device in case we would like to manage connectivity or credentials on this device. Good point. Indeed, we need to move with the times. Avisei, can you, can you hear us now, your connection? Good. I can hear you. Good. Can you hear me? We can hear you well. So what could you okay. add to that in terms of the opportunities that ISIM and ISIM brings to 5G IoT? Yeah, so uh, now technologies uh, bring uh, new opportunities to cellular IoT by uh, enabling new business models. It can be the vehicle for uh, mass deployment, making the deployment much simpler, and it also can increase the total available market for cellular IoT. Uh, because we all know that cellular is a kind of a superior uh, connectivity technology. It's uh, more reliable than any other. Uh, you can trust it uh, to be connected and, of course, the global coverage. But still, a lot of the IoT market uh, goes to different uh, connectivity technologies uh, because of uh, size, and uh, cost, and complexity. And uh, with technologies uh, like uh, ICIM, uh, we address uh, these challenges by uh, integrating it uh, into the uh, SOC and providing a much smaller device, more cost effective, and just works. Connectivity just works out of the box. And uh, by that, we are enabling uh, much more people to adopt it much faster. All we need to do is to enable uh, the modern world with uh, having iSIM inside uh, their module, and all the rest of the supply chain can benefit from a simple uh, cellular connectivity and from their business model, 
which may attract uh, much more uh, vendors cellular IoT, like the fact that they will not need to have uh, the knowledge complexity uh, of dealing with uh, the cellular system, but just uh, have all the benefits uh, and uh, without all the things that uh, make them the other activities to do. Thanks, Avisay. And just back to something you said on your keynote, you say security is actually one of the important pieces of ESIM and ISIM and, and is actually the key enabler. And we were having a very nice conversation back then um, about, about that. And security indeed is, is crucial uh, for the success of any new technology for any market stakeholders. And it can represent both an opportunity and a challenge. And that here's always the catch with this. So company like yours, guys, you sell services for which a security breach can be catastrophic and actually reputationally damaged for you. So do you have any concerns about IoT security in this new 5G era? And if yes, what are they? Let's start with Sariat, David. Um, I suppose 5G does have additional security features. That's great. Every, every standard you know, will have some kind of level of improvement. Uh, I suppose the, the major concern that we still see is that you know, it still has to interoperate with 2G, 3G, 4G. And um, there's a lot of significant security concerns within the mobile network with all of those generations. Um, you know, and they're down to things as simple as location tracking, SMS interception, denial of service, etc. So, you know, that's the unfortunate thing. 5G just inherits all of those security vulnerabilities. Um, however, the, there are additional security concerns because of the exposure of an increased number of APIs. Um, you know, so that does increase the, the threat landscape, you know, within IoT. However, however the, the there's always these small incremental improvements when you look at something like eSIM or iSIM in addition to this. So um, because there's no physical SIM card there, you know, that is a significant security improvement because we can't steal it. You know, it can't be removed. Um, so, yeah, as I said, there are issues, um, you know, because of the, the past, but I think going forward it's a step in the right direction. Fantastic. Avisai, you know, I was quoting you at the beginning. What do you think uh, on secu security wise? So, if we put the uh, security of the connectivity protocol aside for a minute, uh, because this is uh, improved in 5G and in general taking uh, good care of uh, by uh, the ecosystem of cellular. So we have many other uh, security issues or challenges uh, in IoT that are not 5G specifically, but inherited from uh, 4G and uh, 4G generations. What we have today is that in most cases, uh, a single SOC device, we have many layers, and those layers are uh, belong to different uh, business centers, I would say, and we need to protect all the layers. And, not only the connectivity layer. And, and maybe I, I can say that uh, the most important layer is the application layer, because this application deals with uh, the business logic of, of the IoT uh, user, and it actually has the most value of IoT, uh, the sensing and consent of the device. So the challenges we have to protect all the layers, protect them from physical attacks, attacks, uh, we need to optimize the security protocols uh, by IoT devices because, in particular, in LPW, the, the device is low forces and low on bandwidth and low on uh, power. So, we need to optimize the without jeopardizing security. And we need, of course, to ensure that the right software is uh, run and many other examples. Okay. So, we believe uh, improving the uh, all the layers I advise is critical because we've seen a lot of attack. Uh, the more deployment uh, that will be there, we will spread more attacks. 
So uh, as mentioned in, in our keynotes earlier, uh, we uh, are doing a lot of things uh, in order to protect uh, the edge device, our side of devices, uh, starting with the hard trust, working out of uh, ecosystem hard. You will use software based on trust to all security layer. But we also think that there, there needs to be uh, less effort by the ecosystem to address the topic I mentioned, and in particular, uh, adapt uh, the legacy ways of securing uh, communication and devices to uh, the capabilities of uh, LPW devices. It is partially done the connectivity case uh, by TSMP improving the ease of ice to LWA, but it needs to be uh, done all the layers. And of course, GSMA is already doing work on uh, security guidelines for the entire device of the connectivity. And we think uh, we hope that uh, this work uh, gets uh, more faster and uh, more specific. And, and by more specific, I mean uh, not to provide only the generic guidelines of the device, but actually a different uh, definition or specific definition to the different layers of an IP device. So we can be sure that what is implemented and work in harmony with different layer and our customers can trust the devices to protect uh, all the stock and the only part of it. Thanks, Avise. Andreas, anything to add from your GND's perspective? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say security, and we hear that in, in all these sessions, is not something what we should and can sacrifice for any cost reasons. I think that's something what is, for me, quite obvious. And uh, as, as Avishai said, we have several stacks we need to work with and integrate security. It needs to become part of our DNA when we design IoT services. Let me, let me briefly take a look on what the, the SIM industry has implemented over the last few years, and we can leverage that for IoT. Because at the end of the day, we have a certified manufacturing design software development environments, which allow us to, uh, on a regular basis, also audit um, and allow us to build uh, a temper-resistant environment, which could be the eSIM or the iSIM. So where we, where we also can manage all these root of trust services. But the second part is the backend services. And these backend services may be a DP plus, uh, an SR or an DP, which as well is being very well uh, specified by the TSMA. There are some security schemes. They need to be re-audited every second year. So we have here two endpoints which we can leverage. On the one side, these temper-resistant environment of a SIM, of an iSIM, as root of trust, and we have the remote management capability of uh, a DP Plus, for example, to manage connectivity, to manage applications, to manage certificates over lifetime. I think this is a very essential value we have created in the industry. But is this, does this really fit the requirement of the IoT market segment? I would say there is some more elements we need to think through. For example, um, NB-IoT devices, um, for a, a lot of them need to be provisioned in manufacturing lines. So we need to now find a solution, and GSMA in, in, the, in the various working groups are working on it. How can we link these high secure management environments, certified environments, with uncertified environments of manufacturing. And I think here we have already a very good tool set in hand. We have already the first approaches of the industry, how that could work so that we can load connectivity credentials, security applications during the manufacturing of devices. And I think that, that's a very essential element, um, what, what, what we need to enable connectivity for IoT. And we, for example, from GND, beside the working with the GSMA, we are also working with players, what we have heard with, with Deutsche Telekom, in a new SIM context to say, how can we manage credentials? How do we understand the requirements of all involved players to finally find the best working solution for all of them? Fantastic. 
And it is in there where we want to go about what are we doing, what is the, what the industry need. And, and in GSMA, we tend to, we try to listen to the industry, stakeholders. And that's why we have several initiatives. Rich at the beginning mentioned a few with the foundry projects now, but we work a lot on 5G on ESIM. Within the GSMA ESIM team, we're working on a new architecture for ESIM IoT devices. So that's why, but we always look into what else, what else should we be doing, what else is what the, the industry is looking for. So let me ask you, Barry, sorry, it took a while to come back to you. You've been heavily involved in GSMA for a good number of years, as you mentioned. So what's your view on what GSMA should be further on ESIM and ISIM technology? Um, well, I, I think it's worth saying a huge thank you to GSMA for, for galvanizing the whole industry and agreeing a single way of uh, And I'd like to personally thank Jean Christophe Toussel, who led the initiative, made it all happen. Uh, but in thinking of what the GSMA should do next, I'd like there to be follow through. And what I mean by that is that the GSMA cannot simply say, now the specifications are written, our job is done. Uh, many hundreds of companies, including my own company, Netlink, are investing millions of dollars into eSIM. And I'm sure all of these companies will have implementation issues to solve and will be looking to the GSMA. And of course, this is where uh, the GSMA excels. Uh, what we've seen already uh, at various light events is where the industry comes together to solve interoperability issues. And I'd like to see more opportunities for the industry to come together and discuss and debate topics outside of the specification uh, development activity. Thanks, Gary. Taking notes on that. So, David, what else could you say GSMA could be, could be doing? Um, I, I think the GSMA could probably play a role in um, looking to possibly lower the bar slightly in terms of the. Um, security credentials and requirements you know to be a manufacturer involved in that ecosystem at the moment like they're exceptionally rigid um, and as a result the barriers to entry are very very high um, and when i look at kind of iot everything around iot to me is around cost and reducing cost so anything that adds you know increased complexity um, you know reduces the ability for new entrants to to enter the market, et cetera, means that costs won't come down. Um, and if those costs don't come down, then it limits the potential for IoT growth. Um, so that, that would be our kind of concern. Um, when it comes to something like 5G specifically, um, I would see the, the, the rollout of something like uh, the bilateral agreements between mobile operators uh, in 5G roaming as being something that the, the GSMA could possibly facilitate, you know, a little bit more and make that a little bit easier because most of the IoT connectivity is through roaming agreements, you know, so there are, there are SIM cards that, that would be, or SIMs that would be roaming. Um, so if we could actually enable that 5G roaming uh, a little bit faster, because I can just see that taking quite a long time for all of those bilateral agreements to take place based on, you know, kind of what we've seen over the past few years of even, you know, the 4G bilateral roaming agreements uh, being implemented. I think we've only just really come to the end of it now, so it might be anything from two, three, four years before everybody has a bilateral 5G roaming agreement. Yeah, that's indeed Deutsche Telekom was telling us about before as well. So, thanks. So, Andreas, uh, any takes on what else GSM has to be doing? Yeah, I, w I would say um, when we talk about specification in, in, in an IoT landscape, I, I would even say um, specification need to be as clear as possible. Um, and I can tell you from many commercial projects we are running, um, we, we increase some of the, the, the discussion topics when we run into some optional features of specification. I think that that is one 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 topic which is, I would guess, generic for all all specification work to find the right balance. That's an important one. The second one I, I would like to add, um, coming back to the security. For me, security need to be a holistic horizontal layer across multi-players, multi-deployments, and 
I would say we need to be relatively strict on security and clear, uh, but de 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 define and specify the right level for security, but horizontal across all deployments. But where we need to have more flexibility and adapt the, 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 the different, the variety of devices is in these vertical market segments, because we have unmanned devices, we have any kind of devices being deployed by technicians, um, we have any constrained device. So there's a large variety of devices we have outside on the market. So we need to be open for remote management of connectivity, of credentials, in, 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 in fab personalization. I think here we, the, the flexibility is something what, what, what I think is important to also put some more focus on. Thank you, guys. We're running out of time, so unfortunately, we don't have any more time for any questions. But thanks you all. Thanks for very interesting insight. Thanks for your knowledge, for your fresh views. And I hope we can see each other all in person very soon while Congress LA is coming. And I'm going to ask you all to stay because we have very interesting keynotes and panels coming up. Thank you very much, you all. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much to the panelists and to Gloria for a very interesting panel. Next, we're going to go and have a bit of a deep dive into IoT Safe. Uh, first of all, we have Paul Bradley join us from Keegan. He'll be um, giving us an overview of the work that they've been doing in this space. They've done quite a lot, and he wants to be able to show it to the world. So um, he'll, he'll, he'll take you through the, the work that they've done in that area. So thanks very much. If Paul would like to come to the stage. Uh, if we could bring up the notes and the slides, please. Great. So, welcome, bienvenue, bienvenue, Kate Mila Folcher, and welcome to everybody tuning in on my MWC Online. My name is Paul Bradley, and I'm the Strategy and Innovation Director at Keegan, an ARM company. Our mission is to simplify and lower barriers to accessing secure connectivity, therefore accelerating digital transformation, which is leveraging IoT. We're well known for simplifying security and device supply chains through the integrated SIM technology which we've conceived. I lead the marketing and commercialization track of IoT Safe in the GSMA Working Group, where we've united industry colleagues from across the spectrum connectivity providers, cloud service providers, device manufacturers, module and chipset vendors have collaborated to specify this game-changing technology. End-to-end -end encryption has become one of the great debates of our time, with privacy often being pitted against public safety in the consumer messaging context. Enterprises leveraging IoT, on the other hand, consider data being collected as an extension of their own network, IoT devices harvest data that they consider their property to analyze and derive insights from in order to automate our everyday tasks. They could even possibly anonymize and sell that data by brokering it to others. Looking at the image, I bet many of you are still waiting for a cherished moment with your loved ones, once it's safe to do so, and we're getting there. Acknowledging that we haven't been good enough until now is always important to move forward. I feel we must apologize on behalf of the mobile IoT ecosystem that enterprises have been treated as second-class citizens when it comes to IoT security. To use an analogy, in Sims and Secure Elements, we have built a wonderfully secure Fort Knox-like bank. There's plenty of safety deposit boxes available inside, yet in the enterprise IoT space, we've left you to choose between keeping your valuables under the mattress, or to build your own bank next door. Enterprises haven't had ready access to a secure place in devices where they can store their credentials used to protect their data from device to cloud. 
enterprise data protection has ultimately been treated as less important than protecting the radio layer from eavesdropping and from subscription fraud. This was because there was a lack of an open standard to, uh, in order to use the hardware that's already there and cost constraints in the IoT space. It hasn't always been practical to build a second bank by adding a second secure element to protect enterprise credentials. Thanks to IoT Safe and the brilliant group of companies who have come together to collaborate and work on the standard, that's all about to change. But first, let me introduce you to Ruben Paul, the now 15-year-old CEO of Cyber Shaolin, one of ARM's four Gen 2Z panelists who spoke with ARM's CEO, Simon Seegers, back in 2019 on this very stage. Well, the one in Hall 4. Let's listen to what he had to say. You've got the, the world's technology sector sitting in front of you. What, what do you want them to do as they're delivering the next generation of technology? Technology that you create today will impact not only our generation, but many more to come. If that technology is not built securely and built right, then not only does it impact companies and countries, it also impacts us children. So keep in mind that security has to be in place and that we need to make the right technologies because on top of that, we children are gonna come back, have to come back and fix the mistakes that you guys make. So. so Ruben kindly sums up the entire concept of security by design in this very important statement. If technology is not built securely and built right, then not only does it impact companies and countries, it also impacts us children. Of course, none of us would like any Terminators coming back in time to get us because we didn't bake security into IoT device designs, which will then go on to scale and become more and more omnipresent. So let's see what we can do about lowering barriers to access that baked in security. So what kind of measures do we need in order to protect enterprise data? Back in June 2017, I had the pleasure to speak at MWC Shanghai and introduced the notion that security measures applied to any data in transit should be directly proportional to the value of the data or the automated actions triggered based upon it. So for example, a simple temperature sensor might collect and send extremely public information, such as the outside temperature at a given location back to the cloud. But if that data, is directly used as part of a decision algorithm to increase or decrease production of energy, then the criticality of this trivial and public data and its integrity becomes extremely, extremely important. And guess what? If data isn't valuable, or if it isn't being used as part of a digital transformation in initiative, then perhaps you need to review the IoT strategy as probably there's a glitch in the matrix. At Keegan, we understand the impatience of enterprises getting their digital transformation strategies in place. The COVID pandemic has been a huge accelerating factor for digitization, especially of consumer facing services across the board. However, we also acknowledge that complexity and fragmentation in the IoT is a huge barrier to adoption. We're in an ecosystem where there's many operating systems, there's many chipsets, many connectivity modules, multiple clouds and multiple cloud topologies, and many choices of connectivity itself. There are infinite combinations of these elements which cause most devices to be custom built for a given use case, and this in turn is slowing down the mass adoption. We haven't yet reached that eureka moment for the personal computer where IBM published the specifications for the 5150. That was 50 years ago, back in 1971, and that specification then became the de facto standard and the reference design of all future PCs. In the IoT space, the disappointing thing is that all the elements are there. All the technology is there and it's been ready for some time. It's just been too complex to put the jigsaw pieces together and to adopt. As an industry, we need to make things simple and reusable. Most of all, we need to stay laser focused on what enterprises and industry verticals need. That is, cost savings generated by the insights and enhanced end user experiences, thanks to the automation derived from the data that we're collecting in the IoT space. 
Most enterprises, especially the small and medium ones, simply want to plug in somewhat standard devices without the need for expert installation or complex configuration steps. They would like to start having data magically stream from the device to their account in the cloud, where they can manipulate it. The customer experience of turning a device on and securely connecting it to the network should be consistent whether the device is an alarm system, a smart meter, or a smart potato. Speaking of the user need, in a recent GSMA intelligence survey of 2,873 companies across geographies, industry verticals, roles, and company sizes, we discovered that 98% of IoT decision makers see data protection from device to cloud as important. The confidentiality, the integrity, and the reliability of data being collected is of paramount importance to us. But in this fragmented space of IoT, what does a suitable security solution look like, and how do we make the behavior consistent and universal? How do we avoid the complexity of many-to-many -many integrations between the ecosystem players? And what about non-cellular IoT, which is massive? How can we ensure that there's the best, most consistent approach, which covers both cellular and non-cellular angles? Many connectivity service providers offer both cellular and fixed services. They often sell connectivity and home devices or alarm systems, yet often mobile and fixed parts of the same organization aren't co-creating IoT services on common foundations. Clouds and enterprises want something to work consistently to secure an IP channel, whatever the physical bearer. Shouldn't we, as an industry, be using the same secure foundation to avoid fragmentation? Should we have to integrate security solutions with every connectivity service provider or every cloud, or should we have something that just works out of the box? And you each today carry many instances of the tamper-resistant elements that were being discussed on the panel just before, storing many different identities, be it your bank card, your SIMs or eSIMs, your passport and ID cards. Why not protect enterprise IoT credentials in exactly the same way in a secure place when it's available? So to summarize, enterprises want something that's consistent, that's universally available, without complex integration, which uses tamper-resistant storage to protect their credentials, which works in the same way as on non-cellular and cellular IoT networks, can cope with constrained LP1 networks such as NB-IoT, LTE CAT-M, and 5G NOR Lite once it's available. And finally, enterprises want something which is simple to deploy, open, and fully standards-based. But IoT Safe is not only about security. IoT Safe is about zero-touch provisioning. In a world where today's state of the art is to preload credentials for a given cloud into a custom-built device, at the time of manufacture, how do we simplify that process? Do we really need an IT department somewhere along the logistics chain? When I speak about seamlessly onboarding a device, it's not just being onboarded to a given cloud again, it's being uh, onboarded to a given enterprise account on that cloud. All that so that the enterprise has the option to own and manage their own authentication and end-to-end -end encryption credentials. I, I, I have a dream, a, like a now realistic plan, that we can turn on any type of IoT device, and we will first automatically localize the subscription to a local connectivity provider of choice. This provider would be selected by the enterprise, and provisioning would work quick and seamlessly, even over the most constrained type of network, thanks to GSMA's remote SIM provisioning technologies, and equivalents of, in the world of non-cellular, like Wi-Fi Easy Connect. And then once connectivity is established, we would automatically enroll the endpoint to the enterprise customer's account on a major cloud's IoT core or edge hub, and put in place enterprise-owned and managed credentials in the most secure and seamless way. The mantra that we need to enable is that any device should be able to exchange any data across any network, and now thanks to IoT Safe, securely exchange that data with a given enterprise account on any cloud. Today, to solve this major industry challenge, we're pleased to announce the Open IoT Safe initiative. For IoT to scale, we need to get past the fragmentation and the provisioning and installation complexity. We must ensure that IoT devices 
from the simplest sensors to more complex devices can truly just be turned on anywhere and start seamlessly interacting with the cloud to exchange information and start helping the enterprise to derive those valuable insights. Keegan has built the open IoT safe provisioning solution on a combination of open standards. We don't want to make this a closed or difficult to access system. That's why to keep things as simple as possible, we're combining two important technical principles. Firstly, the exclusive use of a standard IP channel to exchange with the cloud's onboarding service over a secure interface thanks to credentials securely injected at manufacture. This avoids any interconnecting many clouds to many SIM or secure element trusted service or over-the-air management platforms. This eliminates the associated complex integration effort required with each party wishing to use the service. And the second principle is the use of onboard key generation, meaning that we can generate operational enterprise credentials directly inside the device, which would never leave the secure tamper resistant element. Enterprises can then use these brand new credentials to secure future exchanges with their own account in the cloud of their choice. This technique leverages a best in class security practice, which involves nobody ever knowing the secret credentials used to secure the exchange. They're generated in a robust, secure, tamper resistant environment and stay safe inside forever in their very own safety deposit box. Today, we're putting forward a manifesto to the industry to support the Open IoT Safe initiative, which relies on four key pillars. Fulfilling the dream of simple, unified, zero-touch provisioning. We turn a device on, the connectivity is localized for cellular or non-cellular. Cloud provisioning seamlessly takes place over one unique IP channel. The device can then seamlessly and securely communicate with their cloud of choice. Secondly, bringing protection of the enterprise credentials used to exchange data with the cloud up to the same level as those of the mobile network operator, a payment service provider, or a government by leveraging tamper-resistant hardware. Thirdly, removing barriers to access to tamper-resistant hardware by making things as simple as possible from a technology perspective, by putting in place the necessary bricks to access it. And lastly, using an open standards-based approach without complex many-to-many -many integration steps. Keegan's IoT Safe ecosystem is growing fast. We're working with 10 chipset and module providers, seven integrators and security middleware providers. Our ecosystem connectivity partners provide connectivity to enterprises in 182 countries and we're working to seamlessly enroll and onboard devices onto three major clouds. All of this to offer device to cloud security to over 50,000 enterprise customers of our ecosystem partners. And these partners already have over 100 million IoT devices managed in their portfolio, and their enterprise customers will be ready to leverage Open IoT Safe in the near term future. And a very, very big thank you to all of those partners for their support in the initiative. Earlier, I spoke to Tim Mattison, a principal partner systems architect for IoT at AWS, during our fireside chat at the Keegan Partner Program. Let's take a listen. I would imagine that in AWS, you're kind of working with quite a broad range of customers that are leveraging services. On IoT Core especially, are there any particular use cases where you believe that a solution like IoT Safe would be most benefit? and where security is something which is paramount? Yeah, well, you know, I really like the slide that you had where you said 98% of enterprises uh, want end-to-end -end security because it wasn't always that way. It was kind of an afterthought. So at this point, when I, I think about it, it's really difficult for me to come up with an application that I think wouldn't benefit from remote provisioning uh, and harbor security and tamper resistance. Obviously, for something like a safety-critical application, it's, you know, it's required. You, you've got to have it. But for more applications, like you said, the enterprises now have the appetite to do it. They understand what's on the line. So I couldn't really come up with one where, where it wouldn't be necessary. Um, I would love to be able to say I could, but uh, it's just that now, even in the simplest applications, it's just always best to have it baked in. Yeah, I guess like uh, obviously what's the point in IoT if uh, the data isn't valuable to you? Because what's, what's the point of even implementing an IoT service, right? 
Yeah, right. Somebody has already made the justification that the data that you're collecting is necessary. So the data is valuable to somebody. And if it's not valuable, then you really just have to reevaluate. Do we need to build this particular solution at all? You can listen to the full fireside chat and how Keegan and AWS are together enabling several methods for provisioning devices to AWS at the Keegan Partner Program, now available on demand in the MyMWC online platform. Together with a brilliant bunch of colleagues at GSMA, we've put together a new white paper on IoT Safe to walk you through the benefits of leveraging tamper-resistant hardware for securing end-to-end -end exchanges with the cloud. And you can download it from here. IoT Safe is taking the world's most popular end-to-end -end security protocol and protecting the credentials used to establish trust in the safest place inside the device, the SIM, the eSIM, the iSIM, or secure element. This in turn enables secure, seamless cloud enrollment and onboarding for enterprises, leading to full zero-touch provisioning flows allowing IoT services leveraged by digital transformation strategies to scale. IoT Safe is connectivity agnostic, meaning it can work in the same way over the various categories of cellular network communications and any IP connected device featuring a SIM or secure element. A whole ecosystem of major actors in the IoT space from chipset designers, module providers, SIM and eSIM providers, connectivity providers, software developers, and IoT cloud service providers are already including support for IoT Safe. The secure yet simple means of establishing end-to-end -end encryption combined with the potential for zero-touch provisioning that's brought by IoT Safe will change the world of IoT device to cloud security forever. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Thanks very much to uh, Paul. That was uh, really interesting and uh, great news about the launch of the uh, IoT Safe uh, Forum. Um, I'm Ian Panel. I'm from GSMA, and I'm going to be leading this next session, which is going to be a panel looking at IoT Safe in, in more detail. Uh, we've, we've heard about it from Paul. It's a very specialist but important topic, uh, how we keep IoT, IoT data secret how we authenticate the endpoints, and also to do this with a minimum infrastructure, a minimum cost, and a, a minimum level of complexity. Now, I've got a panel of um, great speakers to talk about this from Microsoft, Talis, Orange, uh, Sequence, and, and, Ke and Paul, obviously, from Keegan. And uh, I'd like to introduce them first. Uh, Jean-Francois Gross from Talis. Perhaps you could introduce yourself. Sure. So um, I'm Jean-Francois Gros. Uh, in charge of uh, strategy and, and marketing for mobile services at Thales. Uh, I'm sharing uh, with you <laughs> the uh, IoT Safe work group at the GSMA. Uh, and I'm very pleased to, hear, to be here. Thank you, Joffre. And, uh, and, and Leila de Charette, who's an IoT security expert from Orange. Hello. Hello, everyone. So I'm Leila. And I'm working in Orange Cybersecurity. So in our teams, uh, we are pen testing, auditing, uh, certificating IoT devices and platforms. And uh, also, we are involved in GSMA Works. And uh, we are demonstrating at Orange Booth currently uh, Orange implementation of IoT Save uh, done jointly with Thales. So do not hesitate to come to see us. And, and in the green room at the back there, uh, whilst we were getting ready, Leila assured me not only is she an IoT security expert, she's the best IoT security <laughs> expert in Orange. Uh, and, and Paul, uh, perhaps you could reintroduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm Paul Bradley. I'm the Director of uh, Strategy and Innovation at Keegan and Arm Company. Uh, and so I also lead the marketing and commercialization track within uh, the IoT Safe Working Group. And uh, online, we've got uh, uh, Microsoft and, uh, and Sequence. So perhaps if we start with um, Morgan Lunt from uh, Microsoft. Uh, 
Hi there, everybody. My name is Morgan Lunt. I'm the program manager at Microsoft on the Azure IoT Cloud team. Uh, specifically, I work on the device provisioning service where it's our whole goal to make it as simple as possible to securely get your devices to the cloud. IoT Safe is a huge help in doing that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, happy to be here. Thank, thanks, Morgan. And finally, and, and not least, uh, Jeremy Gusto from Sequence. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad to be here. Um, so Jeremy goes to. I'm doing a product marketing for Sequence Communications. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, and we'll start this off with uh, noting that uh, you can't help uh, but uh, uh, notice the the impacts that COVID's had both on on this exhibition and also on society in general and digitization uh, and and the move to digi digital services uh, uh, in society. So perhaps uh, the, as a first question, and I'll, I'll, I'll point to John Francois first, you know, how can IoT self help accelerate digital transformation uh, we see happening everywhere? Sure, <clears throat> thank you, Jan. Um, digitization, what, what does that mean concretely? So it means a more and more connected world. Uh, more and more connected world means more and more connected devices, and I like very much uh, mobile World Congress motto, which is connecting the billions of, of everything. Uh, billions of devices uh, means that security is now as important as, as connectivity. Uh, you need to ensure that users, enterprises are well protected, privacy, data alterations, mutual authentication between device and cloud. Uh, without this being done, there's, there's no more IoT. So, but billions of devices means that you need to provide such security at, at scale. Uh, and the beauty of IoT Safe is that this is something which is leveraging the SIM present in every single cellular device. And this is something which is now standardized. Uh, thanks to the GSMA, now it is labeled under the AA35 um, uh, governance, which is giving a very powerful message to the industry that they can rely on something which is standardized where everybody is now talking the same language. And in that sense, that would definitely help digitization. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Leila? Well, I think simply more our customers, they trust in IoT, more their data is protected, more they feel that their privacy is respected, more IoT business will grow, you know? And more IoT business is growing, more digital world will become. Thank you. Uh, and perhaps uh, moving to our on online colleagues, perhaps to um, uh, Jeremy first. All right. Thanks, Ian. Uh, indeed, as you know, was said uh, earlier on today, security has a significant cost in IoT. And even though 98% of the people would like uh, to have security enabled in their devices, we see with OEM customers that they have a tendency to avoid paying the extra cost for full security, which is a pity because security is key in IoT. Now, good practice is in place, um, and usually this is done through a hardware dedicated route of trust, but it has a cost, it comes with an effort, and requires some know-how. And then without this, uh, it takes time for digitalization to take place. And I see IoT Safe as being an enabler to lowering the barrier for security by enabling the OEMs with easy access to end-to-end -end security with lower cost. So this really enhances, enhances the value of cellular IoT versus other IoT networks. And um, yeah, and because it takes away the part of the complexity and the implementation for the OEM. Uh, and Morgan, as, a, as a, a cloud service provider, how do you see this uh, transformation helping? Yeah, so IoT site definitely helps with digital transformation in that it increases engineering and deployment efficiency. If your device already has an authenticated identity as a result of connection with the cellular network. So why not piggyback on that um, if it is of sufficient security, which now at IoT Safe it is. Um, and use that. You don't have to stand up your own PKI. You kind of have a secure element already on your device. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for devices to get attached to the cloud. Thank you. And, and, and finally, Paul? 
Yeah, so uh, I think digital transformation, if we see it from an enterprise's point of view, which we don't do enough, they, they, they're really kind of waiting to, to seamlessly collect data, use it to basically, uh, you know, for cost savings, to be able to, um, you know, improve customer experience by automating our everyday lives or, you know, generating cost savings on their side. Now, the, today, a lot of the IoT, and, you know, I, I don't like to be, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, too, too crass in it, but it's, it's still geeks with Raspberry Pis, building prototypes and whatever, and not a lot of enterprises have the scale and the size and the expertise and the skill set to be able to put together what they need and then go and, and um, let's say, get their devices built according to the use case that they need. And um, I think IoT Safe creates a common foundation of trust that enterprises can use. And let's, let's face it, IoT in the non-cellular space has a pretty bad reputation when it comes to security, at least. And, um, you know, we, we, we need to kind of, you know, make sure that that foundation of trust is in place. It's common to all devices. And then we, we build trusted services on top of that so that the data can seamlessly flow in a secure way from chip to cloud. So, th thank you, Paul. Um, you talked about the, uh, the, the, the business uh, interests there and, 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 and recognizing those. I think it's, it's very important that we do relate to, to the end business problems. And, and perhaps we could sort of talk about the critical business problems that IoT Safe addresses. And, and perhaps starting, to, starting with perhaps the, uh, 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 the member of the panel that's probably closest to the end, the, the, those business people is the, the, the device or the OEM uh, manufacturer. So, uh, Jeremy? How do you feel about that? Yes, um, so from a module and chipset maker standpoint, um, we can indeed provide hardware with security built in by design with an interoperable and standardized approach, removing any proprietary approach which comes with a cost for the industry. So really the cost is one of the uh, critical business problem which is solved by IoT Safe, you know, this know-how that Paul was talking about, and, and the fact to use proprietary approaches, all of this is getting away uh, with IoT Safe. Mm -hmm. and, and Morgan, from a cloud provider, what, what are the critical business problems that you see IoT Safe fixing for you? The critical element for us is ensuring that devices are securely connected to the cloud. You don't want to open a situation where someone can group your device or DDoS that solution. The IoT solution becomes not so useful in that case. And IoT Safe is too pronged in that it's a very secure way of establishing trust between your device and the cloud, and it's rather simple to implement. It's kind of a, the first of its kind for being able to be both. Additionally, high security is really hard, and finally, it's been brought to a higher level of need. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and perhaps looking at, at uh, uh, your role in this uh, uh, John Francois, what, what problems do you perceive uh, IoT Safe addressing? Yeah, <clears throat> indeed. I mean, IoT service providers, they are specialists in their own domain, health, transport, industry. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them are really not experts in security. Uh, uh, at Thales, I mean, security is our DNA. Um, and it's very important to. Uh, to bring security uh, seamlessly. Uh, it means that those, those guys that just need to, to declare the, the, the devices, and, and that's it. Uh, everything gets provisioned automatically uh, from device to cloud. Uh, the security is, uh, is, um, is maintained. So we take care of the security. We take care of the provisioning in a totally seamless manner. Uh, and this is where we believe that um, it helps a lot service providers uh, to really focus on their own business, uh, but still uh, taking advantage of having a, a totally secured device. And perhaps, Leila, perhaps you could explain how, from a, a network operator's perspective, uh, the, these business problems uh, exist. Yeah, yeah. What happens on our side is that uh, we do have uh, industrial players who are coming to see us, to see Orange, asking for a connectivity offer. So they want to connect their devices. And this IoT Safe initiative, it can help us to bring a security without dealing with a complex negotiation with the device manufacturers and so on based on the standard 
and based to bundle it somehow with a connectivity offer. Because as Morgan said, uh, we don't want to, to insert in our uh, whole system and whole network a kind of a DDoS uh, weak point uh, so that the whole network will be compromised, you know, the whole platforms will be compromised because uh, devices were compromised. So what we see as advantage is Together with the connectivity, we can propose it to big industrial players. We can propose more security. All right, thank you. Um, and perhaps we can think now a bit more about uh, what IoT Safe is. Uh, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, Jeremy and ask um, what is it about the IoT Safe approach that makes it so attractive? One way I see IoT Safe very attractive is the value it brings in its scalability. You have a SIM naturally present in every single cellular device, whether it's a discrete SIM chip, MFF2 or, or, or plastic SIM, or fully integrated, like an IUICC integrated in a secure enclave. So you have it naturally. And it is based on a standardized secure element, on a standardized API, and using standardized AT commands. So all of this allows full scalability. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Paul, uh, what do you see? Um, well, like, yeah, I think it's about kind of breaking down barriers to access the, the, the connectivity in the, in the most seamless and simplest way for the enterprise um, and then securing that connectivity. So, you know, again, when, when we break it down into the components, indeed, we have, uh, we have the application, so that's, that's, that's one step. We have the, uh, the, the, the enablement of the device and, of course, then we have the, uh, the, the need to provision that device. And I think, you know, w one of the key things that we always need to remember, again, from the enterprise perspective and also from the cloud service provider perspective, is how do we really simplify all of the kind of today's logistics where, you know, I, hear, I speak to OEMs and they tell me that they're loading credentials along some kind of a, a supply chain to, to be able to, you know, provision a device for a given enterprise account on the cloud or that, um, you know, there's, there's a provisioning service where you have to actually pre-know or pre-call an API to be able to, to, to configure that automatically. And I think from an enterprise perspective, the, the device the sim, everything beneath it is, is the weeds. They, they, they really don't understand our world. And I think the more we can do in, in uh, ensuring that as an industry we come together to provide something absolutely simple, uh, without having to teach them what we do, we, we solve the problem for them and then those components kind of, you know, stay as a, you know, under the ground, if you like, you know, in, in the weeds and uh, that the enterprise can just leverage them simply. I, I like that, um, that, that, that position, make it simple. Um, and uh, reusable. Yeah. And usable, yeah. Morgan, um, perhaps the same question, you know, what is it that makes it attractive to a, a cloud service provider? Yeah, really Paul's nailed it. Um, there's two key terms that really jump out to me when talking about IoT safe, and it's late binding and zero tech provisioning. So late binding meaning you're not going to associate an identity with your device until it's late in that device's life cycle as possible. So manufacturing, distribution, sold through a chain of resellers, whatever, when the device is made, you don't necessarily know who's going to be deploying it. And no one wants to plug in a serial cable and reprogram cloud credentials on your device before deploying, and that can get really costly for a lot of devices. IoT safe, you slide in your SIM, and you have your identity, and you have your connectivity kind of all in one. Um, and zero touch provisioning is, goes along with that as well. You don't touch it. You don't use a serial cable to add credentials. Um, it's taken care of for you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, move, moving along, um, we, know, we kind of know a little bit what, what it is, but, but how do we use it? How, how, how does um, uh, an enterprise enable IoT safe? Um, I'll, I'll ask John Fonsoir. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> That's very simple. <laughs> That's probably the most simple question. I mean, just need to put a dedicated applet or that specific applet standardized uh, a GSMA and TCA into the SIM, um, and you're good to go. Uh, as Morgan said, uh, everything is being provisioned remotely, automatically. Uh, it can be done in the factory. It can be done at device switch on. Uh, 
so I just need to put the applet in the device, uh, in the SIM, and then in the device, and, and you're good to go. So uh, obviously, uh, on the device side, uh, you, you may want to update the, uh, uh, the TLS stack and so forth, but that's so easy. All open source are now available. Uh, so the, the only thing to do, indeed, is to, uh, is to put the applet into the SIM. Can be, can be placed into uh, different domains, either a transversal domain or MNO domain, uh, up to the service provider. That's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Morgan, uh, at the other end of that link, the, uh, uh, in the cloud service, what, what, what would a, uh, uh, an enterprise need to do with you? Well, the key thing that we're working on in partnership with some MNOs is the ability to ingest the public portion of your certificate stored on your SIM card in an automated way. So we're building out um, concepts right now with several MNO providers where you can take the public keys which the cloud service needs to authenticate the device and automatically transfer them from the MNO's database. So really, it's going to be point and click. It's going to be connect my Azure account with my MNO account transfer the certificates over. You don't ever have to download files. You don't have to understand how certificates work. But the security is there. And that sounds good. Um, and, and you mentioned operators there. So I think I'll, I'll look at Layla and ask the same question to Layla. Well, I would say simply come to see us and uh, request <laughs> the connectivity, and you're all done. And uh, we will remotely provision, as Jean-Francois says, an applet. And, uh, it's a standard TLS, so there is really low cost of integration of cloud, uh, no cost integration of cloud, so, yeah. I, I would just add, actually, that uh, if you are here and you have time, then, then if you want to see it in operation, then, then do go along and see the orange stand, because there is an exhibition there, and there are two people who can, uh, can run you through far more detail than we have time to do here. Um, perhaps uh, I can... Uh, uh, look at uh, go keep with Layla actually, uh, and ask Layla to think about what the best example of an IoT safe application could be. Well, the examples are, as I said, industrial players who have uh, connected devices. We were thinking at Orange about um, medical equipments. You know that uh, unfortunately, uh, recently, many people they need an oxygen assistance because of well-known virus. And uh, maybe you don't know, but uh, this medical oxygen assistance, uh, they do all have hand sensors which are connected and which are capturing uh, when you're breathing in, breathing out, just to know how much you go and uh, sending this data. So this kind of data uh, we really see as a data which should be protected and uh, which is a sensitive, so it, the whole system cannot be compromised because if there is any compromise of the system, a DDoS, there are human life which is on stake. So this kind of application we can see, or, or any other industrial application like airplane sensors, uh, which are also sensitive because uh, you can't compromise them, uh, and they're also connected, and they're also sending temperature and uh, all stuff, which is really important. Right. Thank you. Um, and and Jean-Francois? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you again. Yeah. yeah, I have a very cool example, which is live. Um, and, and maybe you've heard Philippe Vallée, our executive VP yesterday talking about drones. Um, so th this is the way, I mean, we use IoT Safe to secure our, our, our drone business in, in, in Thales. Uh, this is something live. You know, drones, they have to broadcast their identities. They have to broadcast their location to different endpoints. Uh, endpoints being like the police on the ground, um, the unnamed traffic management service, or the drone operator. And obviously, uh, uh, this information will be broadcasted very securely uh, for obvious reasons, because drones can be commercial drones. So they can be uh, military drones as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use I IoT Safe for that purpose, uh, to, uh, to broadcast this data uh, from, from the drone to the different endpoints in the most secure way. Uh, and Jeremy, can you think of a, an interesting application? You know, when I was thinking of it, the best example I was coming up with was also uh, tiny medical devices. Uh, and not only for what Leila was saying, because indeed, uh, patient data needs to be secured end to end, but also because you can have the, you can use an embedded uh, secure enclave 
to secure this data through you know, IUICC functionality and IoT safe, you can uh, do it in a very in a very tiny manner rather than uh, you know, using more space. So I'm I'm more seeing it uh, not only as a way of securing the data, but as well as a way of doing it in a very uh, small real estate uh, by using Secure Enclave. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, so, so where do we go next? Um, what are the next steps for, for, for the industry, for various players in the industry? What are the potential future use cases that we might have? Paul, could you give us a steer towards that? Yeah, so, so firstly, like in, in terms of next steps, so like, like I explained, I think um, that there's a lot of ecosystem players that are already preparing support for IoT Safe, which is brilliant. We're, we're really making great, great strides towards having this, uh, the device support. So Jeff just mentioned the TLS stacks, which need to be kind of enabled for IoT Safe. So that's, that's all great. The open source is there for, for a lot of the major TLS stacks. Uh, the SIMs need to be, um, let's say the applet just needs to be loaded onto a SIM support that supports IoT safe, so that's already kind of all happening. And then uh, the zero touch provisioning uh, all needs to be just tied together and then we have IoT safe systems up and running because, uh, you know, again, uh, like I explained earlier, a single IP connection is good enough to provision your credentials, so that's brilliant. Uh, there's no complex integration and stuff like that necessarily needed, which will address both cellular and non-cellular. Then in terms of a future use case, I would say that um, you know, we, we have one which we've kind of discussed within the group and we've, we've alluded to in the white paper, which, uh, which I, I mentioned earlier on, which is starting to secure the, uh, the booting of the device. So meaning that uh, within the IoT device, we have uh, obviously a software which is, uh, which is running and to protect the integrity uh, of that software and make sure it hasn't been tampered with itself is going to be paramount. And so one of the future evolutions of IoT Safe we're looking at uh, next will be indeed uh, to, to secure the integrity of the software that's being loaded in the IoT device. So, thanks, Paul. And, and perhaps um, uh, Morgan talked a little bit about, uh, about what's happening in, in, in uh, Azure in terms of getting ready. Is there any more you can talk about on that, Morgan? Yeah. Yeah, next steps is, is really me and my team doing our part to help create more reference architectures with our uh, SDKs, with our client software SDKs that Azure IoT produces, help contribute the TLS staffs to have them interface with the SIM applets to get for IoT safe uh, quick operations. And then lastly, just building out the connections I spoke of previously with MNOs to make it really simple to ingest your credentials from your connectivity provider into your cloud provider. The better that we work with the connectivity providers, the more seamless an experience we can create for other folks. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and sticking with our only online participants, Jeremy, um, at the device side, what, what, how, what preparations are you making? Um, you mean in terms of um, next preparing steps. the next steps yeah, for IoT yeah, yeah, Safe? Yeah. Oh, yeah, IoT Safe. Yeah. Um, so, we do work uh, in two ways. We work in a way we're working with our partners, uh, such as uh, Talos and, and, and Kegan and others, just uh, doing a discrete implementation of IoT Safe in a separate scene. We're also using uh, our capability to have a, a EAL5 Plus secure enclave uh, within our platform to fully embed IoT Safe. Uh, within the chip so that you don't even need to have an external uh, uh, SIM card. And this is where we are preparing, uh, you know, the next steps of adoption for IoT Safe. Thank you. Uh, and Jean-Francois? Yeah. Um, so today we use IoT Safe uh, to, um, for the TLS use case uh, to ensure that data are securely uploaded to their own infrastructure, to the different clouds. But the beauty of IoT Safe, it's, it's a toolbox. It's a crypto toolbox. So although we've been focusing on TLS, which is a very major use case in terms of, of security, uh, it can be extended to, to any kind of other use case. So Paul mentioned secure boot, uh, but, but we can go far beyond. Uh, we can introduce blockchain, uh, we can introduce uh, secured firmware download, uh, and so forth. So there's no, li <laughs> there's no limit of IoT safe, uh, although we are focusing now on, on the TLS. 
And finally, Leila, do you see, uh, well, do you see the next steps for, for IFC Safe? Um, the sky is the limit, yeah? <laughs> From, from Orange side, we will extend our implementation. We will extend our current implementation to some new protocols and some new or the different uh, treatments. And uh, we will use it as a candidate feature uh, to our connectivity offer, you know, to bundle it with our connectivity offer uh, with the new customers. And uh, from GSMA standard uh, on the group, I think we'll work on secure boot, on a provisioning interface. Uh, and uh, here you are. I think IoT Safe has a bright future in front of it. So, thank you, uh, and, and and thank you to everybody for for, for the quite insightful uh, uh, words you provided. Um, I think uh, it's very uh, uh, it's a very important sort of area of securing IoT that we're, we're talking about here, and doing it in a way that allows something to scale. Um, uh, allows some. I think that point around. Uh, implementation from manufacture to use and shortening that time pan, time time period, making it as zero touch as you possibly can, is really really important. Um, and doing that with minimal infrastructure and and, and also using common standards that's really important. Uh, Paul made reference to the white paper in his speech, and 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 I I do recommend that you take a look at that white paper. Uh, the links are provided on the. Uh, on the um, Mobile World Congress website. Um, so please, please do that. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming along and participating. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel speakers. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all at a future event of this and perhaps talking about further growth of the, in this area and, and use of IoT Safe. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.